All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our fourth and final um, series in this webinar training with the DOT Endangered Species Act consultation process. Uh, we are starting just about a minute early here today, so we'll um, try to give it a second for folks to continue joining us. But uh, we really appreciate everyone's continued interest in this webinar series, and we're really excited today to be able to bring you another really great set of presenters. Um, today, we're going to be talking about some of the um, new species listing decisions that have come out from both the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries. So we have our long-awaited um, Johnson seagrass discussion today. We also will have some discussion about the noise pile driving calculator, which is a really important tool that we use during ESA consultation. And uh, we have we're you know have several more species specific highlights, and we're wrapping up with a session on the National Wildlife Refuge System, which will be really great. So with that, um, maybe Kendra, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So just kind of the same reminder as before, um, this is the four part webinar series. We do have our sessions available posted out on our website link here. We will share this again later as well and show you a screenshot of how you can go find this information. But it is um, all three recordings that we've done so far as well as the handouts are available online and we've been um, posting those as, as we go. So that that's some really good um, information if you guys want to share that with other folks that haven't had a chance to attend or if you just want to you know refer back to it as a resource or if you have new staff coming online um, that want to kind of catch up with this session so with that i'm going to go ahead and hand it over to kendra to remind you guys of how to participate in the webinar today great thank you katasha and good morning and welcome everyone to the final webinar of our four-part series my name is kendra putris and i'll be assisting our presenters with today's online event uh, you can submit your questions and comments to our presenters at any time throughout the presentation using the question pane on the GoToWebinar doc. We will be pausing a couple times throughout the presentation to answer those questions, and we'll pause again at the end of the webinar to address more questions. There are uh, some handouts available for you to download, and just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded. I will now turn it back over to Katasha to kick off today's ESA Laws and Listing Updates webinar. Thanks, Kendra. And if you want to just maybe stay on camera, I'm going to go off script for just a second. So I would like to see if we could have Kendra and Denise and Ruth just briefly turn on their cameras. Um, I just wanted to extend my appreciation for these ladies. Um, putting together a webinar series at first seems like um, a lot more of a simple logistical thing than doing a live and in-person training, but it's really a lot of logistical work. And I just want to take one moment to recognize all the you know countless hours behind the scenes that these three ladies have put together for you guys to organize content organize um our speakers help to make sure they're well prepared and understand the platform that we're using and um, be able to put up the content immediately after everything's um, done so just thank you all um, i know we don't have like a really fun way to clap or anything like that like we do on teams but please just uh know that i think the audience appreciates your efforts as much as i do so thank you so much Sorry for the quick uh, <laughs> interruption to the. To the uh, Thank you. And then um, that being said, I think we also have to make sure we're extending a really good um, thank you as well to Mark Cantrell, who is listening in today uh, with us and not on screen, um, but as well as Dave Rydeen and Curtis Gregg, who have spent also a lot of time and effort really um, preparing and also kind of coordinating speakers for us. So thank you guys so much for all the efforts you guys have put into this. So with that, we'll introduce our new speakers for today. Uh, we have Jose Rivera with us from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Jose started um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service in 2016 after an 18 year career with the Army Corps of Engineers. He's the supervisor for the Division of Environmental Review in the Services Florida Ecological Services Office. He has a background in regulatory issues. So part of his duties include supervising the DOT funded positions. So that was Mark, Zakia, and John, who you guys have met previously. Um, he's originally from Puerto Rico and he enjoys the beach, hiking and playing music in his spare time. And so Jose has been a really great partner with the DOT and we're really happy to have him here with us today to help go over some of these ESA uh, listing status updates. Um, well, we also have a number of guest speakers here with us today. Um, our first guest speaker is Yogandra, Yoganda Kirkpatrick, sorry, Yoganda. 
Um, she began her career as an intern biologist on the Black-Footed Ferret Reintroduction Project in Arizona back in the late 90s. From there, she transitioned from, the air, from Arizona to Florida and managed a small population of red cockaded woodpeckers outside of Jacksonville for the Department of Defense until 2008. That's when she started working with eagles and accepted a position with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, she was their statewide bald eagle management plan coordinator. She began working for the service in 2010 as an eagle biologist for the southeastern U.S. and currently reviews all incidental take and nest take permit applications. She provides technical assistance and frequently works with state and federal uh, law enforcement officers um, and their agents to investigate uh, potential violations of the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. And so Uganda, um, I'm privileged to see bald eagles a lot of times actually at the St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge. So kind of tying two things into that uh, for the speakers today, but um, thank you for all the work that you do to protect that really majestic species. Looking forward to your presentation. We also have um, Kevin Kalis with us from the Fish and Wildlife Service. He's in the coastal program um, as a coordinator for the South Florida and Everglades uh, area and is stationed in the National Key Deer Refuge in the Florida Keys. He develops partnerships to support and implement habitat restoration projects. He's focused on federally listed and at-risk species in his work area. He's also the office's recovery lead for the Black Rail, which he's going to be speaking about today, as well as the Red Knot. Prior to coming to his current position with the Fish and Wildlife Service in 2016, Kevin spent more than a decade conducting research and monitoring migratory shorebirds and marsh nesting birds in Delaware, after, he, um, after which he worked as a program manager for both states, the state of Delaware and Washington, overseeing the state wildlife action plan revisions, environmental review, and species status assessments. He received his MS in Applied Ecology and Conservation Biology from Frostburg State University in Maryland and his BA in Biology from Albicon, I'm sorry, Albion College in Michigan. So while the black rail has eluded me on my bird checklist, I'm really excited to hear about that species specifically today. It'll be interesting to, to hear about um, that new listing status and what that really means for the DOT projects. Um, next, we have Sandra Sneckenberger, who is an endangered species recovery biologist with the service. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. She's responsible for identifying and minimizing threats to listed species and working collaboratively to recover them to prevent their extinction. During her 14 years as a recovery biologist, her focus been, has been on birds and mammals, serving as the recovery lead for 14 endangered species in Florida. So that's a lot of work, um, a lot of really important work that she does. She's been the recovery lead for the Florida bonnet to bat since 2018. Before Sandra started with the Fish and Wildlife Service, she worked as a biotech at Canaveral Seashore, Everglades National Park, um, she, uh, sorry, in Shenandoah National Park, working on sea turtles, invasive plants, and stream ecology. She received her BS in zoology from, the, from Michigan State University and her master's degree from Auburn University studying the beach mouse ecology. And so um, Sandra's been a really great partner for us as well, just because the Florida Bonita bat consultation area is so large, it affects a lot of our projects, and so she's been a great partner trying to help us figure out how to address that species um, in, in our project reviews. And then we have Jeremy Phillips here with us today as well. So kind of a little bit of a different twist on the species. Jeremy's going to be speaking about the National Wildlife Refuge System. He is the Deputy Supervisor for the National Wildlife Refuges in Florida, the Caribbean Islands, and the Gulf Coast of Mississippi and Alabama. He has a 23-year career at the Fish and Wildlife Service and served as a refuge manager, wildlife biologist, and a biological technician on the National Wildlife Refuges in South Dakota, Mississippi, and Alabama. Prior to joining the Fish and Wildlife Service, Jeremy worked for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. He holds a BS in Wildlife Biology from Texas State University and a Master's in Public Policy Administration from Northwestern University. So Jeremy, again, super great to have you here with us today. The National Wildlife Refuge System holds a special place in my heart personally, and so I'm really also excited to hear your presentation uh, wrapping us up for this webinar series. So thank you all. With that, I'm going to briefly turn it over to Curtis for um, a follow-up on our presentation from last week. Good morning, everyone. So uh, during the discussion last week after uh, Calissa Horn's uh, presentation on the giant manta ray, there were uh, a number of uh, comments and questions about flying manta rays. Um, this picture was um, taken at Satellite Beach off Florida. Um, and as Calusa mentioned, there are a number of um, 
giant manta ray that use Palm Beach County as a, a nursery area. So uh, they're there pretty much year round. And if you're on a boat, you can generally cruise into the shallows and, and get an opportunity to, to see one or more um, giant manta rays. But uh, what I shared with Katasha and the, the rest of the group um, last week on our debrief after the session three was uh, a trip that my wife and I did to uh, Isla Mujeres, Mexico. It's an island off of uh, Cancun on the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, we went down there to snorkel with whale sharks. And uh, during that activity, there were a number of, there were a lot of giant manta ray also uh, feeding on the, the same um, zooplankton and, and um, you know, coral spawn that was um, in the area. It's the full moons in July, August, and September that um, they, they go to that area. We had the opportunity to um, to swim with a lot of giant manta rays. Um, in some occasions, they were jumping out of the water, and we really tried hard to not be uh, under them when they landed. So, Natasha uh, thought it would be good to share the firsthand observations I've had uh, with the, the group. So I'll give it back to Katasha. Thanks, Curtis. I think it just uh, is pretty, pretty cool experience and um, nice to hear your story about how you got to swim with them and everything. So thank you so much for sharing that. So just to kind of tee it up one more time, this is our run of show for today, our list of presenters and the topics they're going to be covering. So again, lots of good species highlights today. And we'll go ahead and um, turn it over to Jose to go ahead and kick us off. Jose, whenever you're ready, thank you. All right, well, good Good morning, everybody. Katasha, thank you for the uh, nice introduction and thank you for the opportunity to do uh, this presentation today. Um, got my webcam open right now so everybody can see my face, but then I'm gonna shut it off so I, you don't see me shuffling through my notes. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about today is just a general overview of the listing process the service goes through uh, for the Endangered Species Act. Um, touch on five-year reviews quickly, and then some updates on, on current listings and things that are coming up. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so what we have here is a flowchart of the listing process um, for Endangered Species Act. This is covered in section four of the Endangered Species Act. And this is how a species ends up getting listed as endangered or threatened. Um, so you can see in this flowchart, we got a couple of parallel processes. Um, I'm gonna start on the one on the right, actually, when we receive a petition. Um, once the service receives a petition to list a species, there is a 90-day process to determine whether it's a substantial or not, not substantial as far as moving forward in the process. If it's considered to be non, not substantial, then the process ends there. If it's considered to be substantial, the next process is um, creating an SSA. SSA stands for a Species Status Assessment, and I'm sure several of you have heard about that. That is the science document that kind of feeds the information for all the authorities that the service has. You know, it, it can inform a listing decision. It can also inform regulatory decisions. Um, the SSA is just supposed to provide the basic science on the species that will inform then, you know, separate decisions. Um, after the SSA, there's a 12-month finding period that will determine whether uh, species is warranted to be listed, not warranted, or warranted but precluded for some reason. Um, if a species is determined to be warranted for listing, then a proposed listing rule is published in the Federal Register, and then it goes through a comment period, and it either gets to a final rule or it's withdrawn. Uh, the parallel process that we see on the left is um, the service kind of keeping track and gathering information on species that 
you know, based on information available, we might consider that may need to be uh, evaluated for listing. Uh, some of these also get an SSA and goes through the process of candidate conservation and, and then it gets into the same process as if it's had with the petition. So you can see kind of in the middle there where it says warranted but precluded. Um, that's a species that probably there is enough information to get to a point where it should be listed, but for other reasons, uh, not able to at the moment. So it can be assessed as a candidate. Um, if the information gets to a point where species doesn't need to be listed, you see where it says candidate removed from list there on the, on the left. Um, so this is just kind of the basic procedure. This, this takes a while. There's a lot of documents that go along with it. Um, we have an excellent classification and recovery section in Florida that deals with this. Um, just talking about the, the overview of the process here. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so once the species is listed, they're required to go through a five-year review. And this review provides a recommendation. It's not a, a, a listing decision, but it gathers information um, to determine whether a species classification can be changed. The document itself does not do that, but it informs that, that decision. Um, the decision to delist or downlist would go through a similar thing as when we saw to get something listed. It would require to be published in the Federal Register get some comments and it requires some it would require some rulemaking. Uh, next slide please. So this is just a short list of, of a lot of actions that are coming up um, and kind of where they are in the process. Um, Miami crayfish is in the 12 month finding period so is it good for tortoise for um, to be federally listed. Suani alligator snapping turtle it's Pending a final rule, um, bonnet and bats, and there we'll talk about that. Revised proposed critical habitat, green sea turtle, is the critical habitat for for nesting. There's a proposed critical habitat for the green sea turtle, and Okaloosa darter. That's a nice one that I like to talk about because um, it achieved conservation and it's pending a final rule to actually be listed. Our Classification and recovery section has a more robust work plan with tons of things that are coming up. And, and if you need that information, we can certainly provide it. So just let me know. Next slide, please. All right, so we wanted to talk about the Panama City crayfish. This one just very recently got listed as threatened um, with designated critical habitat. Um, the rule also provided a 4D rule. Uh, under the Endangered Species Act, there are no prohibitions with threatened species, but a 4D rule can provide that. Um, prohibitions as far as uh, ways to actually um, get some projects done. We currently have a programmatic biological opinion that we're working on for Panama City crayfish that I believe is going to help out a lot for consultations for the DOT projects and the species. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the mitigation policy for the service. Um, right when I started in 2016, there was a mitigation policy that was proposed, but it was withdrawn uh, a couple of years later. Uh, reverting back to the existing policy. So I understand there's plans to update the service-wide mitigation policy um, this year. And you can go to the next slide, please. So some of the things that this um, revised mitigation policy will provide, it will build in the 1981 existing version. Um, to provide a, 
consistent and effective recommendations for mitigating adverse impacts. So it provides a framework um, to actually, you know, compensate for losses and try to achieve a no net loss. Uh, like I said, this is all pending. When this is finalized, I believe it, it's going to help, but we're still kind of in the process. Uh, next slide, please. Just want to talk a little bit about U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, we do a lot of things. One of them is, is law enforcement, and you can read there what the mission of our law enforcement office is. These guys do do a lot. Um, we work with them uh, as far as violations of, of Section Nine, uh, Section Seven, incidental take permits that. Um, Conditions are not met. They help us with that. There's a presence in the National Wildlife Refuge um, system. And these guys also do a lot of work with international trade of wildlife. And I think that's um, just a broad overview of a lot of the things that the service does. Uh, to get a little more specific, uh, we're going to talk about Green species that we deal with a lot with FDOT projects. And we deal with them enough that I think we have a good way to work through the issues. Wood stork, we have an effect determination key that provides some, some math as far as calculating um, biomass for foraging habitat. And as far as compensating for impacts, the purchase of wetland mitigation credits uh, can do that for wood storks. So that's one way that we deal with that species. For skinks, that would be the, the sand skink and the blue-tailed mold skink. Uh, we have an established survey methodology and based on known locations, then we can kind of calculate an area. And we have a conservation banking system that can offset impacts to um to the skink habitat um for indigo snake we have effect determination key to determine when there's an effect we have standard protection measures and in the event that we need to do some compensation we have an established fund with the florida wildlife foundation um, to do good things for the species And I believe that may be my last slide. Does, if anybody has any questions uh, related to, you know, kind of the overview of what the service does. Yeah, Jose, it looks like we have um, one question in the chat, but I also wanted to see if you might be able to um, describe. So it's my understanding, like, say, for insects in particular, um, if you guys are making a listing decision, you have to list either the entire population or not list the population. But for other species, say like the gopher tortoise that you had on your slide that's a candidate, you could list certain um, segments of the population. Could you like confirm if that's accurate and then maybe describe, are there any other species or types of um, groups of species that you would only consider listing the entire um, population or not? That That is accurate. Um, you know, the, the service is able to list a distinct population segment of a species. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what's going on with, with, with gopher turtles. Um, you know, trying to think of other examples of, of other species where that might be the case. I'm kind of drawing a blank, but I can get that information for you. You know, I know there's um, there's caracaras out west, but, you know, they're, they're listed in Florida, but, you know, that might be a subspecies thing. Um, but but you're absolutely right. There, the the service can list a distinct population segment of a species, not necessarily the whole range. Okay, okay. thanks. And then um, so we do have a question here about the candidate species. And so the question is, can you explain what protections or documentation is needed for a candidate species versus a you know a threatened or endangered species? And so what does the Endangered Species Act require a project to consider when, when there's a candidate species, say, in the project limits? Well, it depends 
where in the process that candidate species is. Um, you know, if it's in the part where it's being considered for listing, um, that's probably around the 12 month finding, um, we can write a conference opinion for, for those. Uh, as far as species that are not uh, in that part of the process, you know, ESA doesn't really provide protections. Does that help? I think that helps. And I think maybe from a DOT perspective, we might expect that those species be acknowledged in like the natural resource evaluations slash biological mm -hmm. assessment. And then just kind of, we need to keep an eye on that listing status as the project moves on from like pd &E into design, you know, as we're moving closer to construction to see if that status is changing. And if there's anything we might need to consider, right? But so that we're not potentially having a take situation halfway through construction, um, if that listing status were to change. So I think just kind of keeping tabs with you guys as the project moves through the process is, is really critical. Um, but, okay, good, thank you. I agree. So it, it looks like maybe there's a, it's not exactly a question per se, but maybe just a clarification about the swanee alligator snapping turtle. Um, is that a subspecies or do you have any additional sort of information about that one in particular? I believe it is a subspecies. Um, and I can get you what we have on that. I, I don't have it offhand. I'm sorry about that. Okay, no, no, no problem. And then just um, again, maybe another one for, for following up, but is there any links that you can provide or references for the Eastern Indigo Snake Mitigation Fund or another way that the Florida Wildlife Foundation helps the Eastern Indigo Snake? So um, if you have anything to, to add on to that you know, discussion, please feel free. But if it's a, something you maybe just want to follow up with, we can certainly um, follow up with that topic as well. Yeah, I'm going to need to follow up on that. So I don't have the, the links right offhand. Um, sure. But, you know, it, it's been a way that we used to compensate for impacts to indigo snake. I'll make a note. Okay, great. Thanks. We'll be sure to share that out with folks. And thanks, Jose, for um, talking us through this process and giving us the, the status update on those few species. All right, thank you. So I think with that, we're ready to transition over to Curtis. Good morning, and I'm here with the presentation that um, has um, elicited a number of comments. I wanted to acknowledge that the um, this Johnson Seagrass presentation is one that uh, Adam Brain um, put together for an, another meeting recently, and um, he agreed to let me modify it for this um, this presentation. So um, he's the species recovery coordinator for the small tooth sawfish that he um, gave an update on earlier in this um, series. And he's also the species recovery coordinator for Johnson Seagrass. Next slide. So an overview of uh, Johnson Seagrass uh, it was first described as a species in 1980 based on morphological characteristics. Uh, it's similar to other species of Holophila, um, but a couple of things were different about it. Um, on Florida's East Coast, um, there haven't been male flowers found, there's no seedling recruitment. Uh, it's able to survive in a wide range of conditions, including some pretty yucky places uh, down here, some of the canals. Next slide. So as far as um, Johnson Seagrass and the Endangered Species Act, um, 1993 was the initial status review. It was proposed to be listed, um, designated, um, a critical habitat was uh, proposed as well. Um, in 1997, during the uh, updated status review, there was a call for um, genetic analysis, and um, that call was repeated in the 2002 recovery plan um, for genetic analysis. Next slide. And as a result of some of those um, calls for, for additional research, uh, a number of researchers have uh, conducted uh, genetic analyses of Johnson seagrass. Um, some of the early work by um, Jewett Smith and others and um, Waycott and others in 2002 uh, in particular is of interest. And then um, Waycott and others in 2015 provided a report to NOAA using uh, neurogenetic techniques. And um, they, they proved that Holophila johnsonii, Johnson seagrass, was not a unique taxon, but they didn't 
have the evidence for um, saying exactly what, what species it was. Next slide. So uh, Waycott and others continued their work on um, Johnson seagrass, and in 2021, they um, provided a manuscript using the most uh, updated um, DNA sequencing and, and gene genetic analyses, and this is uh, well outside my wheelhouse. Um, so if you have questions about um, this information, direct them to Adam. Um, but as a result of that work, uh, the NOAA Genetics Group um, reviewed in detail um, the findings and, and methods, and they, they agreed that the methods and conclusions of the paper um, were correct. And so, next slide. Where does that leave us now? Well, as a result of those findings, um, it was determined that Johnson seagrass no longer meets the statutory definition of a species. And so the National Marine Fisheries Service um, has they published a um, proposed rule to remove it from the Endangered um, Species Act on December 23rd of last year, and the 60-day comment period closed um, late last month. So um, Adam and his colleagues in the Southeast Regional Office um, Protected Resources Division are reviewing, currently reviewing those comments, and they will um, publish a final rule to address those comments and um, make a, a final action. Next slide. So in the event, and it, it seems very likely that um, Johnson seagrass is going to be delisted. Um, so an Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultation will no longer be necessary for that species of seagrass. Um, but other ESA listed species under the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, purview will still require consideration if they're in the action area. It, this action is only related to Johnson seagrass. But um, as far as conservation of that seagrass species, um, it will still um, be included in the essential fish habitat consultations under the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Um, you know, Adam mentioned that essential fish habitat is defined as those waters and substrates necessary for fish spawning, breeding, feeding, or growth to maturity, and that the Magnus and Stevens Act does not differentiate which species um, of seagrass in terms of its uh, essential fish habitat. So, no fishery service will still be uh, conserving. All of the species of seagrass that occur in Florida, uh, but under the essential fish habitat consultations moving forward. Next slide. So Adam included a link to the Johnson seagrass page um, on the NOAA Fisheries website. And if you um, navigate to that page, uh, you'll be able to see the species overview, the proposed delisting rule, and the FAQs. And it's got a link to the um, the Waycott and others 2021 manuscript. And that's it for um, this presentation. So segueing um, to some other uh, National Marine Fisheries Service uh, listing updates uh, of interest here in Florida. Uh, as many of you know, there are uh, seven species of ESA listed corals occurring in Florida. Next slide. Uh, one of them is um, the Acropora cervicornis uh, that you um, see here on the left. Um, it's a thicket probably off Broward County. Uh, on the right, we've got a uh, figure that shows the range of Acropora cervicornis um, it's throughout the Caribbean, up the Florida East Coast to around the Boynton Inlet, which would be in um, FDOT's District 4, um, throughout the Florida Keys, um, FDOT District 6. But um, it's an important uh, keystone species throughout the Caribbean. Next slide. Um, here we've got a um, thicket of um, elkhorn coral, um, Acropora palmata, at the Molasses Reef in 2017, right after Hurricane Irma. You can see um, the some of the um, broken branches uh, on this, this colony. 
Uh, on the right is a figure showing the um, the range of elkhorn coral. It, like um, staghorn, it's throughout the Caribbean. It um, doesn't extend as far up the east coast as, of Florida as um, as staghorn does. It's probably mostly in the uh, the Florida Keys. Next slide. So um, here we've got a figure showing the um, designated critical habitat for um, elkhorn and staghorn coral. Um, this designated habitat goes all the way to Point Inlet for both species. Um, it uh, cuts off at Key West and uh, picks back up out at the uh, Dry Tortugas um, on the, the west end of this, this map. The, the final rule was published in 2008 um, for Florida and designating um, that extent. So on the, this slide, um, we've got two of the um, more recently listed species of um, coral, hard coral in Florida. The mountainous star coral on the left, um, the red box indicates approximately where the zoom view uh, below is from. Um, on the mountainous star coral, the, the individual polyps are similar in, in size and shape, and the colony kind of looks like smooth peanut butter, uh, to think about it like that. And on the right is a uh, colony of boulder star coral, uh, Orbicella franksi, that's showing plating morphology. And it, it does this plating when light is low, and it's trying to, to get as much surface area oriented to the, the surface of the water as possible. Um, and shown in the black circle below, you can see that uh, the polyps are different sizes and shapes, um, and, and that's probably the easiest way. This is more like crunchy peanut butter. Um, it's easier way to tell the difference between the, the species. Next slide. We've got another species of uh, Orbicella, the genus Orbicella. Um, this is um, Orbicella annularis, a uh, colony that's on a reef crest on the left. Uh, the red box indicates uh, where the view on the right comes from. Um, the individual polyps are nearly uniform in size and shape, and you can see the lobes uh, of the different groupings of polyps on this one colony, um, and that's where the, the common name is derived. We've got two other species of um, hard coral that are uh, listed under the Endangered Species Act in Florida, but these are relatively uncommon. Um, the Orbicellas are, are more widely observed, as, as are the um, Acropora palmata and the uh, Acropora cervicornis. On the left, we've got pillar coral, uh, Dendrogyra cylindris, um, that was observed off southeast Florida in 2012. And at the time, this colony had not was not known, and um, this location was dove as a random point for a reef fish count. So they, they found a new colony. But uh, pillar coral has been nearly eliminated from much of the Florida reef tract by the um, stony coral tissue loss disease. So that, that's a, a sad outcome of, um, of that current, current disease outbreak. On the right, we've got uh, rough cactus coral, Mycetophilia ferox, is also known to occur on the Florida reef tract, but it's rarely observed. Um, we have a couple other species of mycetophilia that uh, are much more common. Next slide. So as shown above, um, critical habitat has only been designated for staghorn and elkhorn coral, uh, but the other five species um, designation of critical habitat is expected to occur this year. There's a uh, final rule review um, that may begin as early as this month. Um, there are currently no active uh, petitions for listing additional coral species at this time, but the National Marine Fisheries Service is uh, currently conducting a status review of all seven ESA listed species that occur in Florida. Um, Jen Scholl provided these updates in her, um, her new position as the um, Protected Resources Division Coral Branch Chief. So she says hi. And that's all I've got for these two um, updates. Great, Curtis. Thanks so much. And tell Jen we said hey back. Um, <laughs> but 
uh, I think you may have addressed the questions that folks were having about the Johnson seagrass. We're not seeing any specifically in the chat at the moment, but certainly if folks have questions um, that they think of later, that'll be good to go ahead and share. We can get Curtis back to address any of those. And then I think you did a great job explaining how you're still going to be considering the Johnson seagrass along with the other seagrass species and kind of under EFH. And so just another example of how, how ESA and EFH can sometimes kind of um, you know, overlap a little bit uh, at times. So, um, and then thanks for sharing the information about the corals, just really interesting species. And um, thanks for the updates about the potential critical habitat listings coming out soon. We'll be, we'll be looking for those. Um, one quick question uh, is coming in and I don't know, Curtis, if you might be able to take a look at that so that I don't mess up the, <laughs> the name, but there's a question about a hybrid um, species and is it protected in any way? Would you want to maybe address that one briefly? I understand that a number of coral species are able to hybridize if they're um, very closely related. Um, but I, as far as I know, um, Acropora um, prolifera is not protected. It, it's not an ESA listed species. So it would be protected again under um, an EFH consultation if it were to occur here um, for the, the habitat value that it provides. Great, thanks. So um, if other questions pop up, we'll definitely get back to those. But for now, I think we'll go ahead and turn it over to Dave to talk through the pile uh, driving calculator. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so I'm Dave Riding, no fisheries. I'm gonna turn my camera off so I'm not a distraction here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about pile driving noise and why no fisheries is concerned about it in relation to ESA listed species. So the aquatic environment is filled with a variety of sounds from different sources, including physical sources like raindrops and wind, biological sources from sound producing sea animals and man-made noise sources such as ship traffic and pile driving. And uh, many sea creatures use sound for a number of different activities like communication, prey detection, predator avoidance, aggressive behaviors and mating and reproduction. And this partly because sound travels very fast in water almost 5,000 feet per second in water versus only a little bit over a thousand feet per second in air uh, and it can also travel long distances in water and it's not affected by visibility conditions so it's a good way to get things done in the water some research on the effects of in water sound on aquatic organisms has been done but has increased dramatically in the past 15 years mostly due to concerns over the increase in the amount of man-made noise that's being put into the aquatic environment now. And one of the sounds of concern is pile driving noise. So pile driving noise can have a number of different effects on riverine, estuarine, and marine species, depending on the intensity and duration of the pile driving noise. So effects range from injury or death from very loud noise, to temporary and permanent hearing loss, to disruption of normal behaviors, to increases in stress levels, and also masking or covering up of natural sounds that are critical to the organism. So masking is sort of like you're trying to have a conversation with somebody at a very loud cocktail party where everybody else is speaking at the same time and in the same frequency range. So you're, you're having a hard time communicating with the person you're actually trying to talk to. And so if you have man-made noise, and that's in the same frequency range as what the animal is trying to hear in the water, it can be a problem. So this picture here shows injuries that occurred in fishes that were exposed to simulated pile driving noise in a laboratory setting. So obviously the animals were sacrificed and cut open, but you can see the various forms of hemorrhaging on these fishes' organs. So these species all had swim bladders, which is a buoyancy control organ that's filled with gas inside the fish. In fishes with swim bladder, bladders, loud noise can cause the swim bladder to actually vibrate inside the fish. And then that swim bladder rubs up against the other organs within the body cavity and it results in injury. So what about fish without swim bladders, such as sharks and rays? Well, they're less susceptible to injury from pile driving noise because they don't have swim bladders. And so there's no organ to vibrate inside the fish and cause injury. However, 
they are still subject to potential hearing loss and behavioral disturbance and because they tend to occur at or near the substrate at the bottom like this sloughfish here they can be affected by pile driving noise that propagates through the sediment and rock as well as the noise that occurs in the water column so if you look at the frequency range of sound production and hearing in many aquatic animals it overlaps with the frequency range of noise produced by man-made activities so you can see here there's fish like sturgeon and sawfish and also reptiles like sea turtles and some uh, marine mammals and the frequency range that they operate in is is overlapping with things like like man-made noise like boats and dredging and pile driving and that creates a problem. So moving on to the noise calculator type things. These are the latest noise thresholds for impact pile driving noise that you will find in the new NOAA Fisheries multi-species pile driving noise calculator. And so peak pressure, that refers to the loudest part of a pile driving impulse. Um, so if you look at an impulse, it's got all these spikes that go up and down in that short time frame that that impulse occurs and so the peak is the biggest spike in that in that impulse cumulative sound exposure level or sel cum refers to the amount of noise energy that an animal is exposed to from multiple pile strikes that occur over the course of a day so the animal keeps getting hit with these impulses you know for hours maybe while piles being driven and that's a form of chronic exposure um, root mean square or rms refers to noise it's an, basically an average of the amount of noise energy contained in a pile driving impulse and that's the metric that's used to determine when behavioral disturbance might happen and if you look in the sea turtles pts injury that refers to permanent threshold shift or permanent hearing loss so that's in in sea turtles now we look at injury in, in terms of uh, hearing loss and these are the latest injury and behavioral disturbance thresholds for for vibratory pile driving, vibratory driving tends to be less of a problem than impact driving because the sound produces less intense and it's also different qualitatively. So if you look at the slide before that I had BAM, so that, that's an impact pulse. Vibratory driving is more of a bzzz kind of thing. It may be annoying, but it's not gonna hurt the animal. Okay, so for the impact uh, calculator or the pile driving calculator, what information do we need to conduct a pile driving noise analysis using the new calculator? So first you need to know what material is the pile made of? Is it concrete? Is it steel? Is it plastic? Is it wood? Uh, you also need to know what kind of pile is it? Is it a square solid pile? Is it a pipe pile? Is it a sheet pile? And next, you need to know what the width or diameter of the pile is. Is it a 24 by 24 inch square pile? Is it a 30 inch diameter pipe pile? Is it a 24 inch wide sheet pile? Then you have to have one more piece of information and it's different between vibratory driving and impact driving. So for impact driving, you need to know how many piles you're gonna install in a day and approximately how many hammer strikes it's gonna take to install each pile. And then you multiply those together and you can calculate the total number of hammer strikes that will occur in a day. And that information is used along with the uh, sound exposure level data to calculate the sound exposure level cumulative exposure value. So that's for impact driving. For vibratory driving, you also need to know how many piles you're going to put in in a day. But here you need to know how many minutes of vibratory hammer usage it's going to take to install each pile. You can multiply those together, then you know the total number of minutes of vibratory hammer use that will occur in a day. And once again, along with the sound exposure level data, you can use that to uh, determine the sound exposure level cumulative exposure value. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the pile driving calculator itself and take a look at that. So, there's several tabs in the calculator. Yeah. So the first tab is the instructions. So that just tells you how, how you need to use it, how you need to put things in. The main thing here is that the green cells in the calculator are the ones where you are gonna be putting data in. Um, and the other cells 
tend to they they produce results based on what you put in, in the green cells. Now there is a couple things that have defaults that you might have to change, uh, but I'll go through that in just a second. There's also information in here about the assumptions and where the noise data that's in the uh, tabs that I'm going to show you in a second where that information came from. Next tab is just the acronyms, just spells out what the acronyms stand for, so you know what that means. Next tab is for the impact proxy sound level. So this is where you're going to get your information about the noise levels that you're going to need to input into the calculator. And you can sort these by uh, size. If you want to pick this particular size, it'll narrow it down for you. The, also the material, is it concrete, is it steel, and so forth, is it a sheet pile? Um, the hammer type here is that's all going to be impact because this is the impact tab. Also has information about, these are all projects that were monitored and that's where they get the noise data from. So at the project site, what was the water depth? The other thing you need to know is what distance um, from the pile the measurements were made. The standard is 10 meters, and that's going to be the default in the calculator. But as you can see here, this first one is 17.5 meters rather than 10 meters. So you just have to double check that, and you can change it in the calculator if you need to. And here's where you get your noise data. There's the peak level, the single strike sound exposure level, and the root mean square level. And then there's information about where they got the information from, what project it was, and some technical information. So now we go to the impact calculator. All right, so like I said, the green cells, that's where you're gonna be putting your stuff in. So there's some spots here to put in project titles and contact information, information about what the pile is and how it's being put in and any assumptions you're making. And then you move below that. There we go. And this is where you're gonna put in your information that you got from the previous tab, the noise uh, data. So peak, single strike sound exposure level, and the root mean square levels. Um, here's where the distance comes in. It's, it's got a default of 10 meters, but you have to make sure that that's correct and change that if you need to. Um, the transmission loss constant refers to something in the formula that says how how quickly does sound dissipate as you move away from pile driving so the default is 15 and that's what you're going to probably use most of the time unless you have specific information for your project that in indicates that it's a different uh loss constant but you're probably going to leave that alone there's also a tab here or if you're using bubble curtains or some kind of noise reduction measure you can put in how many uh, decibels of noise reduction you're getting and that will automatically reduce the levels above um, by whatever number you put in. Then you need to know how many piles, okay? So in this instance, I'm just putting in numbers um, off the top of my head just to put something in there. So in this case, I'm saying we're gonna put three piles in in a day, and then each pile is gonna take a 1,000 strikes, and the calculator automatically figures out, well, that's 3,000 strikes in a day. Now you put all your information in, and it'll spit out the results below. So these are the different zones for injury and behavioral disturbance. First one is fish. Um, so for peak pressure injury, if the fish is more than 0.4 meters away, it's not going to get that kind of injury. There's two categories for the cumulative sound exposure level injury. If the fish is uh, over two grams, there's one set. So it, it would have to be within 52.2 meters of uh, the pile driving to be, get injured and it have to stay there basically all day. And there's a different um, different threshold for fish under two grams. Probably the only fish that's gonna be under two grams might be a larval Nassau grouper. The other ones are usually over two grams when, they're, when they are born. Um, then there's a behavioral disturbance threshold. So if the fish was within 341.5 meters of pile driving, it could be behaviorally disturbed going on to sea turtles, different thresholds. So like I said, sea turtles, we look at injury now in terms of hearing loss. So there's two different categories there for peak and for the cumulative uh, exposure. And then there's also a behavioral disturbance threshold, which in this case is 7.4 meters. So 
if the turtle was within 7.4 meters, it could be behavioral, behaviorally disturbed. Um, then if you happen to be doing a marine mammal consultation or it's a ESA listed marine mammal, there's also the zones which are called isoplasts for the diff different categories of marine mammals. And then there's just some information here about the weighting functions that are used. Okay, so moving on now to the vibratory, same idea the, for getting the data. Uh, this is for vibratory, so you can sort by size again and material type. It's all gonna be vibratory. Um, what the water depth was, where the measurement was made and how far away from the pile the measurement was made, which you also got to check again because you may have to change that. It's probably going to be 10 meters, but it could be different. And then the, the difference here is that you're really only using the root mean square data when in the vibratory calculator part of it. So that you just need to get that number for root mean square. And then going into the calculator itself. It's the same idea. You put information here about the project and any assumptions. And then you just need to put in your root mean square number, how far away the measurement was made that you the, from the data you're using. Once again, the transmission constant is going to be 15 unless you need to change it for some reason, but that's a default. Did you use um, some kind of noise attenuation? Let's say you used a bubble curtain and um, you have five decibels of reduction and it's going to re it's going to reduce that number by five so that in, it does the calculation cor correctly also again number of piles you're putting in and how many minutes of uh, vibratory use it's going to take to put each pile in so that would be 150 minutes but the calculator turns it into seconds because you really need to know how many seconds so 150 minutes is 9,000 seconds and once again you've done your part and the calculator gives you information about the size of the zones. So for fishes, there's not an injury zone for vibratory because it's been determined that there's really no chance of injury from vibratory use for fish, but there is a behavioral disturbance threshold that's given. Sea turtles, once again, you have um, potential hearing loss, so there's a threshold for that. And then there's a behavioral disturbance zone also. And below that, of course, the marine mammal stuff again if you happen to be dealing with any marine mammals in the consultation. The other thing that, that um, is done here is that there's, because, oh, so I'll go back to the impact. So, cause this, this is kind of busy. There's actually a report tab that kind of just gives you the basic information you need in terms of what numbers you put in and what the size of the zones are. And there's one of those also for the vibratory, it's the same idea just gives you the basic information. It's a little clean, cleaner and easier to uh, read. And so that is um, it for me for the overview of pile driving and the calculator. There should be a link in the folder that's gonna come out to you folks uh, that has the recordings of the presentations and the attachments. And there'll be a link in there that has a link to another presentation that was put together by one of my colleagues up at headquarters, Amy Shalla. And that also has audio, so that walks you through the calculator, and that's another resource you can use. And thank you for listening. I think we're going to go to questions now. Yep. yep. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we don't have any specific questions in the chat at the moment for you, but I did want to follow up. Um, as, um, as DOT or their consultant is working through the calculator in that spreadsheet that you were presenting, is it your um, expectation that we're including that in the NRE when we send those to you guys, or kind of like, how, how does that work? And then what do you do with that information once you get it? Um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I don't know that you need to put like a screenshot of the calculator or anything, but just the, what the results were, you know, what results you got, um, you know, what information you put in there and what the calculator calculated for you. Maybe the reports tab would be, sufficient to share yeah yeah I think so. okay okay and then so when when you guys get that data then kind of can you explain how you look at that and and use that to um, prepare your biological opinion or other consultation documentation yeah so um one of the things we look at is is this being done in open water where animals can just move away if they are disturbed or is it in a confined space for some reason? It looks like there's a canal there and it's the whole 
canal is insonified all the way across and so the animals can't really get through. Um, they're kind of stuck there. Um, most DOT projects or bridge projects, you know, that involve pile driving, it's going to be open water. So um, then it's just a matter of what commitments have you made? Or are you going to do ramp up where you start hitting a pile lightly at first and work up to full force so that the animals have, sort of get a heads up and they can move out of there if it starts to get too loud for them before they get injured? Um, and um, is there some reason that the animal has to stay in that area? You know, with, with, say you were in the Keys and it was a spawning aggregation site and the animals have to be there at a certain time of year and they are going to be inclined not to move away because they need to be there. You know, is that an issue? We look at things like that. Um, you know, when we first started doing this, I sort of asked the question of, you know, is there some data? that indicates that there's a problem. And, you know, for injury, I think we have a pretty good handle on that. And the reason we started doing this was on the West Coast of the US, they did find uh, small salmon getting killed at, for these were big bridges and big piles. Um, so that's where this whole thing started. Um, you know, we don't really see injured or dead animals floating around pile driving projects in Florida. So we assume that they just move away for, you know, and they may, may move back in at night if there's no pile driving at night or between pile driving sessions. Um, but we look at things like that. But we, you know, in general, we think that the animals just move away. So that's usually the conclusion we come to. The, the thing that's harder to gauge, I guess, is maybe that hearing loss or other sort of impacts that. Yeah, you, and you behavioral disturbance, of course, you know, there's not, there's, there is some work that has been done, um, but sometimes the responses, uh, can vary, but most of the time the animal will move away. Um, yeah. It's not an easy thing to study, really. So, right, right. Um, so we do have a couple of questions coming in, and I think you started to touch on this when you were talking about the open water. But does the calculator only pertain to pile driving in the water, or um, could it be considered in uplands that are adjacent to the water? Yeah, there is actually some information in the. Um, the te proxy tabs that do have some information about pile driving that occurred on land, but it was adjacent to water. So, you know, what you need to know is what noise level occurs in the water from the pile driving that's occurring on the land. So the calculator can handle that. So, because that's in water noise data again. So it's just the same kind of thing as if it was being done in the water. It's just that it's, being transferred, you know, you're going to have some loss of noise level because in that case, it's really just the noise that's going through through sediment, basically, and being transferred into the water. So at some point, it may travel and then come up into the water again, which happens sometimes. Okay, good, thanks. And then, um, <clears throat> so. Let me see. I'm sorry, I'm getting lost here. There's a few extra questions that came in. I think you also touched on this some as well, but can you maybe just go back and reiterate some of the noise mitigation strategies that someone might use? Yeah, um, the one that's typically used is a bubble curtain where you put a basically a some kind of a ring that has holes in it around um, the pile and then pump air into it with a compressor and that all of that sort of wall of bubbles disrupts the noise because it's tra transferring from one medium water, which is very dense, and hitting another medium air, which is much less dense, and that disrupts um, the sound wave, basically. So that's one thing. You can do the same sort of thing where you put a coffer dam around the pile and dewater it. So they're you know, putting an air layer in there again. Um, there are some other things that are being developed, like double walled piles where the, there's a pile inside, which is the pile you're putting in, but then there's this other sort of, uh, another, well, there's a hollow, basically a hollow pile that surrounds that and you can dewater that or put bubbles through that. Um, and that's one of the things that's being developed. I think they use that in the West Coast somewhat, um, but they're trying to make it so that it's not too difficult to use. So that it's sort of like typical pile driving and you're not do, having to get tricky about how the thing works. Um, those are some of some of the things you can do. Um. Great, thanks. Um, 
So maybe one that's more about <clears throat> um, kind of the timing of the pile driving information being available, which we know is, is a challenge at times. We often don't have that available um, during our PDE phase when we have these bridge replacement projects and it typically um, comes up more in design when we can provide the details that you need for the calculator. And so the question is really about how do we um, address this in the natural resource evaluation or the biological assessment. And I think um, it would be my recommendation to try to work closely with your um, design folks to try to get that information early if you can. Uh, I recognize sometimes um, there's a little bit of reluctance to do that uh, until they're really moving into the design phase and have a little bit better handle on it. But if we cannot provide that information ahead of time, then we do just make a commitment. We coordinate with Dave or Curtis to talk to them to make sure they're comfortable with us providing that information later on in design. And then when we do have that, we provide that and go through the consultation process at that time. But Dave, feel free to jump in and address that yeah. in more detail. So, like. I mean, if you really want to go through the consultation right at that moment, um, you can just give us a worst case scenario. Because I mean, generally, you're going to know sort of a range as far as what pile size, I mean, you're probably gonna know what material, probably gonna be concrete, right? For at least for the bridge itself. And you're probably gonna know, well, maybe it's gonna be 24 or maybe it's gonna be a 30 inch pile. So you could go with the 30 inch pile, it's worst case scenario. I mean, you know, it's not gonna be a 60 inch pile. You're not gonna do that. So you can always go worst case scenario and we can do the consultation based on that. And if it turns out you use a smaller pile, that's not a problem, right? So um, yeah, you can go with that route. Great, thanks. Um, another question about the noise. So is pile driving noise the only noise generating activity to be assessed by National Marine Fisheries for in-water work? Um, well, as far as FDOT, yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, there's, there's boat noise and things like that, but that's not gonna get to an injurious level, really. Um, I don't think there's any other noise effects. Now that's, I think, for the most part in Florida for FDOT, it's just gonna be pile driving noise. And I think like you kind of alluded to earlier, the ambient noise is already pretty loud in a lot of places, not everywhere, but in, in some yeah. places. Yeah, and the other thing I guess I should mention is that, um, you know, sometimes we get the information about, about the bridge itself and the pile driving, but if you're putting in like a temporary uh, work trestle or something with pipe piles, you know, we need that information too, because that's another kind of pile driving, even though it's not specific to the building the bridge itself, other than it's needed to put the bridge up. But you need to also include that information too. And then it looks like we have one more question about um, manatees. So somebody recognized that they didn't see manatees kind of in your list of species that we're considering in your calculator. Okay, so manatees, are actually one marine mammal that is under the purview of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so we don't do consultations on manatees because Fish and Wildlife Service does that already. And then, you know, there's other species like sturgeon that you know, in previous presentations we talked about, we split jurisdiction if it's in an estuary, estuarine habitat unit with um, Fish and Wildlife Service, it depends on who the action agency is that's asking for the consultation. So. Um, it just depends on whose jurisdiction that one is. Great, thanks. And just one more quick question for me. Um, it looked like Caltrans has done an updated study in 2020. And so it looked like they were actually using some data from Florida to um, include in their study. Is that, do you know for sure if that's accurate or did I just glance at that incorrectly on the slide maybe? Um, I'm not aware that they've used, I mean, there've been a couple of, of um, projects where monitoring has been done in Florida. I'm not aware that that's in Cal Caltrans, but okay. um, you know, they could be in the works. You know, they're always collecting data from wherever they can. Of course, you know, it's okay. California transportation, so they want West Coast information. You right. know, they might, they might, they have a fair amount from Cat from the West Coast, so they usually use that. Um, but of course, they could include the Florida data. As what what seems to be the case is that it's not radically different in the like, Gulf of Mexico or Atlantic coast versus the Pacific side. So um, could be different if, you know, you were going to a really hard substrate like solid rock maybe, but um, in general, the, the numbers seem to be similar for the same size pile and same installation method. 
deal. Thanks. Okay. Well, I think um, now we're ready to go ahead and take a quick break. So if we could maybe come back at, we'll just go ahead and do seven minutes and go ahead and come back at 1015. Thanks.
All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you got some coffee and had a quick break. Uh, we'll go ahead and welcome Yolanda to go ahead and give us an overview of bald eagles in Florida. Take it away, Yolanda, when you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, Yolanda Kirkpatrick um, here uh, to talk to you today about bald eagles in Florida. So some interesting facts about these critters. Um, they are, of course, our national emblem, um, and they are a very significant spiritual symbol for the Native American population in our country. They were one of the first species covered under the Endangered Species Act, and they have a lifespan. They're a long-lived bird. Their uh, average lifespan is about 20 years. However, the oldest recovered Eagle was uh, 38 years in age. They have an eyesight that is about eight times better than a human. So when you hear eagle eye, that's kind of what that refers to. And Florida has the second highest concentration of breeding eagles in the lower 48. So their physical features, um, about two to feet, three feet in length, their body length, their wingspan is about six to eight feet. They weigh uh, anywhere between five and 10 pounds. They are the second largest raptor in North America. Uh, the California condor beats them out. Now, um, here's a question I get a lot is, you know, how can I tell if I'm looking at a male or a female? And it is very difficult unless um, you can kind of see the pair together. The female is always going to be larger than the male. Um, Subadults have um, pretty varying plumage until about their fifth year. Their breeding, uh, that's when they enter their breeding phase. Their eyes change from uh, dark brown to yellow. Oh, hey, Jose, <laughs> you're on camera, buddy. Uh, their bill changes from uh, gray to black, uh, from gray to black uh, to that yellow color and their heads and tails turn uh, white. So here's a good example. You can kind of see that gangly uh, teenage look there on the left, that subadult look. And then as they uh, start approaching breeding age, uh, you know, they'll, they'll get that iconic uh, white head and white tail. So what do eagles like to eat? Well, they're opportunistic. Um, who is it really? Um, they love to hunt and steal and scavenge for food items. Um, any of us who've been out in the field, you know, you've uh, probably seen them harassing some osprey into dropping their fish. It's a blast to watch the uh, breeding pair work as a team and kind of flank the osprey and uh, get them to drop their fish. It's pretty entertaining. Um, they are unfortunately known to scavenge roadkill. Um, so you will see, you know, fatalities along roadsides. And um, they love landfills. So some of our largest um, concentrations of, uh, of eagles do unfortunately occur at landfills. <laughs> Um, but they do prefer to eat uh, fish, you know, followed by water birds, such as coots, egrets, um, ducks are another favorite. So nesting, um, they, uh, they will definitely return to the same nest in successive years, you know, unless there are issues with great horned owls or disturbance. Um, you know, they will, they will hang on to a nest for quite a bit of time. And especially now that they're reaching carrying capacity in our state, you know, they're, they're, it, there's a pretty fierce fight for territories out there. Um, so, you know, most pairs are likely to have an alternate nest. I believe like the Florida data said that they have uh, 1.5 nests. So, um, you know, per pair. So most of them do have an alternate nest somewhere within their territory. Now, this is a pretty neat uh, fact. You know, they, they build onto their nest each year. And the largest recorded nest um, was in St. Pete, Florida. It was 20 feet high, 10 feet in diameter, and it weighed uh, about the weight of a truck. It was two tons in weight. So they had been working on that one for quite some time. Now they're breeding um, for the human calculate or sorry the human calendar. 
Um, we generally use October to May, um, but I think that August through April in Florida is a, is a little bit um, more realistic. They are coming back earlier into their territories. Um, and they're generally fledging and done uh, about April, but October to May is a good guideline to use. <laughs> Pardon me. August through July is, is kind of the, the timeline for the Southeast. Now, so the male and the female will return to their nest territory. They'll generally lay about two to three eggs in December to January, and they'll incubate for about 35 days. And their eaglets fledge around the 10 to 12 week mark, but they'll stay in the area for up to a month or two. <coughs> Pardon me. So this is a great um, set of pictures, courtesy of the American Eagle Foundation. It kind of shows the progression. Um, it's amazing how fast it is if you look at this. So we start with like little cotton ball heads, you know, at one week mark and and then they're, you know, getting uh, larger and a little more awkward, you know, by then the fifth and seventh week, um, you've got big brown birds that are starting to hang out on the rim of the nest and exercise their flight feathers. Um, so it's pretty easy to tell when they have young in the nest. Now, bald eagles in Florida prefer to live, uh, prefer to nest in live pines, um, but they'll also nest in hardwoods and mangroves. Now, artificial structured use has grown significantly over the past 30 years. Uh, transmission towers, distribution structures, communication towers, light beacons, osprey platforms. Uh, Eagle Watch data from the 2020-2021 season. Um, now, they monitored 1,002 nests. Out of that, 208, so approximately 21% were on artificial structures. So here's a look um, at some of those lovely nest sites that eagles are choosing to nest on. You've got your cell towers and um, utility structures as well. So here's a statewide distribution map of eagle territories for 2022. Um, you can see that Central Florida is, is pretty dense with eagle nest sites um, scattered throughout the uh, panhandle as well. The Central Florida is most likely where, um, if you're working on a DOT project, that's where you're gonna run into eagles. So uh, Audubon Eagle Watch of Florida, fabulous resource. It is a citizen science program and it was founded to address the growing eagle population, uh, you know, in the midst of a, a growing human population. And it was based at the Center for uh, Birds of Prey in Maitland, Florida. Now, um, many folks who have been doing this for a long time relied on the FWC Eagle Nest Database. Um, that is now a historical record. Um, they are no longer adding new data to that database. Um, and the best thing to do is if you have a project is to check in with the Florida Eagle Watch Nest Database because they now maintain that and, and keep it very current. Um, so it is quite helpful. The Generally the GPS coordinates in there are spot on. Um, and when you pull it up, it'll tell you whether or not it's being actively monitored by a volunteer. You can ask questions you know, about the status of the nest. Um, it is a fabulous resource. So their conservation status, um, they were removed from the list of endangered species back in 2007. It was a true success story because, you know, starting with roughly 80 pairs in Florida back in the 70s, um, and then you saw the distribution map previously. So, I mean, it is unbelievable. They have truly rebounded. And the Fish and Wildlife Service estimated um, a little over 300,000, 316,000 eagles were present in the four um, eagle management units, which are basically the flyways in the 2019 breeding season. So that's about 4.4 times more eagles than um, back in 2009. Now they do still remain protected under 
uh, BEGIPA and MBTA, so that's the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. <clears throat> so BEGIPA, it protects eagles, their nests, their eggs, and their parts. It defines take as to pursue, shoot, shoot at, poison, wound, kill, capture, trap, collect, molest, or disturb. So what the heck is disturbance? Um, this is what a lot of folks with um, field projects may run into. It means to agitate or bother a bald or golden eagle to the degree that it causes an injury to that eagle, a decrease in its productivity by substantially interfering with its normal breeding, feeding, or sheltering behavior, or finally causes nest abandonment. So in terms of um, technical assistance and permitting, um, we still use the Bald Eagle Management Guidelines from 2007. That's our baseline to kind of start the conversation to figure out, okay, you know, is it, can you follow the National Management Guidelines? And for projects that fall outside of 330 feet from that nest, but inside 660, the other option is to implement the monitoring guidelines. Now, the monitoring guidelines are meant to be used to avoid disturbance to eagles because you're supposed to have a monitor out on site and they alert your work crews if uh, they see disturbance behaviors being elicited in the birds. You know, somebody's running a front end loader with a backup alarm, the birds are freaking out, circling. You know, your monitor is supposed to say, hey, let's let's try to shut off the alarm, see if they settle back down. So you're avoiding disturbance that way. And finally, if you're unable to follow the guidelines, unable to implement the monitoring guidelines, we do have incidental take permits, which cover you um, for disturbance to a nesting pair of eagles during an otherwise lawful activity. If the birds abandon their nest, there's loss of eggs, loss of young. And uh, we also have nest take permits as well. So uh, e-permits is now our new online permitting system if you need to submit an application. <coughs> Pardon me, there's um, kind of a clunky address there. So one of the easiest ways, if, if you just Google, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service e-permits, it'll take you right to the site. And one of the most important things to note is the support email address, um, because it's it's a new system. It's It's got its quirks and issues and stuff. So if you need help, um, the first place to go is to e-permits uh, support. So I thought this was fun. This would, I think this would be really helpful for folks to kind of um, see a real world example here. So, Using a nest out of the Eagle Watch database, I've pulled up nest OR066. So this is Orange County, and it was the 66th nest documented in the county. That's how the numbering system works. So you can see that um, they've got the 330 buffer, kind of that darker cir circle in the middle, all the way out to the 660 buffer, which is kind of the lighter circle. and um, this was actually a real world uh, kind of situation with DOT. They needed to do some work on uh, State Road 438. So in this example, if you look to the east, you've got the turnpike 429. If you're doing work out on the turnpike, unless it's really loud, like pile driving or blasting, um, there is no need for further consultation. You're outside of 660, you're good to go. Once you get inside 660, you need to do work on Plant Street or State Road 438. Um, if you can avoid the 330 buffer while those birds are nesting, you're good to go. There's no problems. Um, and if you need to work within 660 but outside of 330, you can implement those monitoring guidelines. Um, but again, with some of these DOT projects, you know, the the um, they're not necessarily able to stop and alter work or there may be some discomfort with having a monitor, you know, and, and not having that 
um, that legal coverage of a permit, which I, I totally understand. So you may opt to get a permit anyway, but the easiest thing in this situation would be to follow the monitoring guidelines for that work outside of 330. If you have to, have to, have to do work, exterior construction work within 330 of that nest, during the nesting season, then that's when um, we would recommend, recommend a permit to you at that point. And um, so just real briefly, um, Reese Collins is the um, permit coordinator for the region. And if you have any questions about permit administration, e-permits, stuff like that, she is your go-to person. Otherwise, for technical assistance and minimization avoidance, um, I am the one that can help you there. So thank you very much. Any questions from anybody? Thanks, Shoganda. Um, appreciate the project example. I think that was really helpful, like you said, for us to see and kind of understand those different boundaries and everything. I had a quick question for you. I think earlier you mentioned about Florida being the second highest state that has a, or the second highest concentration of eagles um, in the lower 48. Which one is the highest? Alaska. Alaska meets oh, okay. everything. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, yeah, and then cool. um, I believe Minnesota, but we were kind of neck and neck with them for a while. Um, but I'm st I'm still thinking that Minnesota eats us out just a little bit, but Alaska blows everyone away. <laughs> kind of figured that might be true. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and let's see. It looks like we have a question. If a project is within the buffers of a documented nest that is in a man-made structure, but the structure owner got a permit to remove the nest, is um, coordination with you still needed? Oh, that's a good one. Okay, so um, unless it was an emergency, which we don't really have, I, I can only think of maybe one or two examples over the past 11 years. So we'll assume that this nest removal occurred outside of the nesting season okay so um if they were moved it outside of the nesting season but your work was going to be occurring during the nesting season unless they put up nest deterrent devices the birds could come back and rebuild so it would probably be a good idea to implement some monitoring using the monitoring guidelines just to uh, establish initial nest occupancy and whether or not the birds are gonna come back. But if, if they remove the nest and you're doing the work outside of nesting season, then there's no, there's no, uh, there's no issue there. Yeah, that makes sense, but, but yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> are there, and I was just kind of curious, are there any concerns that you guys have about nesting on any of these man-made structures? Have, have there been any sort of injuries or just, on any other sort of negative uh, results from the sort of high numbers of nests that you guys are seeing there? Yeah, it's it's been pretty interesting. Um, the worst case scenario that we've we've been through is um, young being strangled by communication tower wiring. You know, if you look at those towers, I mean, and now, you know, they're adding and adding and adding to them. Um, and so, if the, you know, the the young, you know, just, you know, kind of exercising and moving around the nest, if they get, you know, caught up on, on the cables or if they're trying to come off the tower and they somehow, you know, get hung up in the cables. We've had some pretty disastrous issues with that. But for the most part, um, they seem to do okay. Um, sometimes with utility structures, you know, if, if their, their nest debris is like hitting energized parts, um, that doesn't bode well for, certainly for the utility company. Um, but we haven't had, you know, too many issues with like the birds being injured as a result. Um, so no, it's, it's been pretty interesting. Like Pinellas County is my best example of um, artificial structures because you know, there were so many Australian pines planted in Pinellas County that, you know, the hurricanes come through, all their pines are knocked down. So now, I mean, I'm a, I think a majority of the nesting population in Pinellas is on a structure. They have nowhere else to go. 
Right, right. So they're able to kind of make do. Well, that, that, that's good that they're able to use those because I know I had heard a long time ago that they pretty much just wanted to, you know, nest in the live pine trees. So kind of good to see that they're able to adapt a little bit. Um, all right. I don't see any additional questions, but I did want to just maybe ask one more of my own. Um, do you guys kind of have an idea of how often the eagles get harassed by the great horned owls and kind of kicked out of their nests? So I'm, I'm kind of familiar with the specific nest in the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge where that did happen. And it, the eagles just never came back to that nest after the great horned owls nested one season. They didn't come back either, but that nest is just kind of like left in ruins now. But do they do that on a regular basis or just on occasion? Or can you describe that a little bit more? Um, you know, I don't know what the stats are of, of that occurring. I've had my suspicions that in some of the development projects, but again, you know, there's a bias there because, you know, we're, it, it's permitted and we're getting monitoring reports, you know, I, that's a great question because I'll, I'll need to quiz um, Eagle Watch. They probably have some fantastic data about great horned owl use. Um, it, it does happen. Um, yeah, and the birds, you know, they will generally um, just build a nest somewhere else within the territory. But I, I'm with you. It does seem, you know, it seems like because we just had a case where, you know, kind of early in the season, the eagles were there, their nest building, everything looks great. Owls come in and the eagles were just seemed to be pretty freaked out. They just did not. They didn't find a new tree, they just kind of hang out and watch the owl. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately we're losing uh, productivity from them this season, but um, yeah, it happens. And, and they're, and the eagles are bullies to the osprey. So maybe right. it's back for, you know, some of that. Right. But yeah, they do a lot of time sharing with osprey as well. So that's when it really gets fun. Is it an osprey nest? Is it an eagle's nest? But if it, if eagles have ever built, maintained, or used a nest, it is an eagle's nest under the Eagle Act. Oh, that's good clarification. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay, I think, so if there's any other questions for Yoganda later, we'll definitely come back to those. But maybe, thank you, Yoganda, so much for the presentation. Um, maybe we'll go ahead and transition over to Sandra um, to talk about the Florida bonnets and that. Good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk more about the Florida bonnet bat, and also thanks for including me on this training. I've I've heard a lot of really neat presentations, just like um, the, this last one on bald eagles. So thank you so much. First, um, let's start with an overview on Florida bonded bat biology. Um, if you have any experience with temperate bats, temperate species like maybe the Indiana bat, uh, maybe just set that those thoughts aside momentarily because the Florida bonded bat is is quite different. It's it's a very large comparatively bat, and and it's a tropical bat. Um, it roosts in tree cavities, tree hollows, and snags. It does not roost in caves. It can travel really long distances to forage over 50 miles in a night. Um, it uses a variety of habitats for roosting and foraging, and I'll talk more about that. Um, it has known population substructure. So the, that, that just means that the populations are somewhat isolated and don't uh, like all the Florida bonded bats in, along its range do not randomly mate with each other. They're more isolated. Um, this species is active year round. It doesn't hibernate. And um, you heard Jose talk about SSAs and, and listening processes. And the Florida bonded bat um, kind of fell between when we changed some of those pathways and so it does not it never had a species status assessment before it was listed it also doesn't have a recovery plan um but it does have a conservation strategy and consultation guidelines and the guidelines are maybe something that you you are familiar with but um all that to say that there's a lot of homework that still needs to be done in this species and we're still learning a lot about it uh just every day practically Okay, so as far as habitat use, um, foraging habitat for the bonneted bat is 
well, first they they have really significant spatial needs. You saw that they um, that they they can forage over 50 miles in a night, and their morphology they're they're built more for uh, long distance fast flight, less designed for um, weaving through the forest like maybe a small forest bat. So remember, think of a larger larger creature. Um, they need dark, unobstructed areas. Again, they're, they're, um, they can't turn on a dime <laughs> like some of the smaller species. Um, they're equipped to eat larger, harder insects. So they're a bigger bat. They've got bigger, a bigger mouth and bigger teeth. And so they're eating uh, larger insects like beetles and large moths. Um, insect producing habitat is really important to the bonded bat. So what is what would that be so almost anything with with vegetation can produce some insects um but you know there's a gradient like uh, obviously pavement is is going to produce zero insects um and a monoculture lawn is probably not going to uh, produce much um but many other things that are um that we would consider kind of urbanized might be um, and then you have all the way in the other side of the gradient, you know, the habitat that is producing like, like forests and wetlands that are producing a ton of insect prey for, for this bat and others. And sometimes overlooked as far as foraging habitat for the species is open water, river edges, prairies, pastures, though that can also be really important um, foraging habitat. And then roosting habitat. We don't know a lot about natural roost for this species. We only know about of about 25 that um, we've surveyed. And so far we know that, that they'll roost in pine, both longleaf and slash, bald cypress and royal palm. And so those type of communities that have those trees are really important, like pine rocklands, pine flatwoods, cypress. Um, we also know that roost trees tend to be larger in height, like 15 feet or higher and also have a greater DBH, so um, eight inches or greater. And, you know, again, this is, these are, these are helpful tips, but not, you know, not absolutes. Um, the photo, you'll see in the photo, the, the barkless tree in the center uh, was an active roost at the time, just to give you an idea of, of um, one example of what a Florida bonded bat roost tree might look like. So life history of the Florida bonded bat. So they have a harem type social structure and you can, you can also um, hear them referred to as um, like their, their roost being maternity colonies. So basically there's a dominant male um, and several females and they're young of various ages and genders. And breeding activity pot might occur year round. We, we don't really know, but we do have documentation of um, young pups in 10 months out of the year. So it's like it's it's possible that it is occurring year round. We think they raise on average one pup per year, um, but we do not know, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we're still learning and that's that's one of those hard ones to figure out. So we, that's, that's still um, a question. Lifespan is also, um, we're not sure about, we, uh, estimated as at about 10 years. Um, population size is another big question. Um, based on acoustic detections of just what bats are on the landscape, um, it appears that there's a lot less, a lot fewer bonded bats than other bats. And then also based on the colonies that we know about, um, we still think there's less than a thousand individuals. And these individuals have a clump distribution and again, demographically isolated populations. So again, we, we don't think that there's just a kind of, they're, that they're spread around their, their, their whole range. It appears that they have clumped areas that they um, have populations and that those populations are um, to some extent isolated from each other. 
okay, so that was listed as endangered in, in 2013, so it was pretty, pretty recent. Um, and the primary threats, you know, it mainly is all about habitat loss related to human development. Um, if you, you know, if you, we talked about their foraging habitat and the roosting habitat, and those are key areas that are, you know, have been developed in, in the last few decades and are continuing to be developed. Um, we think they have a very small population size, a restricted range. I know that it seems like a very large range. It's, you know, it's a lot of peninsular Florida, but it, for a bat, this is, if if not the smallest range, it's one of the smallest, smallest ranges for a bat. Um, the species is also vulnerable to catastrophic events uh, like um, hurricanes, taking down uh, roosts, um, fire, um, uh, climate change, cold snaps, uh, things like that. Okay, so these are some potential threats or are threats and potentials for impacts or effects of actions that might help you when you're thinking through projects. Um, again, foraging and roosting habitat, losing, losing that and, and roosting habitat. So we, we, we kind of have an idea of what that could look like. Foraging habitat can be a lot of things. Um, loss of active roost, of course, that's even, even worse if you're, you're losing a colony. Um, lighting can be an issue, especially if it's near roosting habitat or even worse, near an active roost. roost um, noise, you just heard talk about how noise can be a problem for species. Um, same with the bat, especially if it's in, in or near the frequency of their echolocation. Um, alterations of hydrology can affect plant communities, um, obstructions of space. This is, so, so again, the bat is using, um, using, you know, uh, it's flight space and, and oftentimes um, we don't really think about it, but the um, adding a tall structure can, um, they, they can, use, they can lose habitat in, in their flight space as well as on the ground, if that makes any sense. Um, roofers and nuisance wildlife professionals, this is often an inadvertent effect, but um, just due to lack of awareness, um, there's been issues where folks are doing remodeling or getting a new roof and uh, Florida bonded bats or other bat species um, are getting, um, you know, smushed and and killed or harmed um, from those activities. Insecticides and pesticides, we don't um, have a lot of information on this as far as effects to this specific species, but because they eat insects um, and also um, forage around pastures, we think that it might be an issue. And there was another, um, Roost tree, if you like looking at roost trees. <laughs> um, okay, so project planning. We have a few tools that can help with project planning for the Florida Bonabat. Um, the consultation area um, we have, we have the Florida Bonabat consultation guidelines, and those have a lot of information, including uh, a, a lot of, you know, a, a framework basically that can um, help guide acoustic surveys roof surveys, also how to avoid and minimize impacts using best management practices, how to offset impacts. Um, we also have a proposed critical habitat at this time. I'll talk more about that in the next slide. So, so uh, I wasn't sure how much that you all had talked about critical habitat, and I don't think that there has been much, so I'm going to go ahead and define it just in case, or it's a refresher if we've already heard about it. Um, but critical habitat is, well, they are specific areas that contain physical or biological features, also known as PBFs, if you hear people rattle off around, rattle on about PBFs. Um, 
that are essential to the conservation of the species and that may need special management or protection. So, for example, PBFs for the bat are going to be, um, you know, t most important ones are going to be tied to roosting and foraging habitat, that sort of thing. Um, so, critical habitat, a critical habitat designation only affects federal agency actions or federally funded or permitted activities. And they are a tool to guide federal agencies in funding or in fulfilling their conservation responsibilities. I hope it would be to guide funding their conservation responsibilities, but it, it just is a tool to fulfill. <laughs> um, so, um, so oftentimes, like if you had a if you have a project in in a critical habitat unit, it can be, and you're doing a Section Seven consultation you might do a conference opinion um if it's a final critical habitat you it would be a part of the bo of the biological opinion but um i think the the bottom line is if your project is in in florida bonded bat proposed critical habitat or any other species critical habitat and you're not sure what to do just add that to one of the things you want to discuss with fish and wildlife service and we can guide you through the process there's usually a lot of moving parts especially when you're going from proposed to final and all that um for the florida monobat i was hoping i had have more to share but um i don't and so the the bottom line for critical proposed critical habitat for the bat is that um, the proposed units that you see is what you are to use at this point and i'm not really sh i'm not i'm not sure what the timeline is for for the next step okay so recent projects and future efforts so all this um work on the bonded bat is pr it's been really incredible since uh the bat was listed especially and it's been really very collaborative a lot of work from uh, FWC and universities and Zoo Miami, a lot of folks, um, not just me, but together, um, what we've been doing and will continue to do is conduct acoustic surveys to better understand uh, range of the species, movements, threats. Um, we're also trying to locate natural roots to figure out what factors um, are influencing their selection of roosts. Uh, we're also looking at impacts to individuals that live in urban areas. And we're developing techniques to accurately and safe, safely monitor the species. Um, there's also a need to do additional public awareness, like we talked about for um, folks doing demo, demolitions and roof repairs. Um, we're also developing a data framework, which will make it easier um, for consultants to submit um, surveys and um, and coordinate, you know, with consultation. Um, and also for us to use that data to, you know, um, reevaluate the consultation area and BMPs and things like that. Um, we're also looking at population genetics because the population, if they're depending on um, how isolated they are and how isolated they should be, how we should manage them um, differently um, as different management units, basically. Um, and we're looking at the effects of restoration efforts, everything from hydrologic restoration to fire and other habitat restoration. So yeah, thank you very much. The best way to reach me is through email. Um, and please don't hesitate. I work alongside with John Rublick. He's our DOT liaison, and he is usually my gateway to all DOT things. So either work through him or, or contact me, and I'm happy to talk about uh, Florida Bond Bats at any time. Thanks, Sandra. Um, that was a great overview and thanks for putting it in context for our projects as well. 
Um, so was that second roost tree an RCW tree or did it just happen to have the white painted ring around it? I think it was, um, it's been a few years, but I think it was also an RCW, yeah. Cool, cool, okay. Uh, so we're getting some good questions coming in. And uh, the first one is kind of going back to your discussion about the um, sort of foraging habitat over fresh water. But the question is also, um, should open areas of salt water or estuarine water, body, water bodies, um, say like coastal areas or along the intercoastal waterway, be taken into account as foraging habitat since these areas can still produce insects and if they should be taken into account, um, are they considered lower on the scale or you know, what kind of quality uh, should be considered when assessing those habitats? That's a really good question. Um, and I, I, I think, I think um, for now we should consider it, like consider it as potentially being foraging habitat and take along all the other information as well to make a final decision of whether we would consider it or not. Um, there, it, there seems to be maybe um, uh, a, a kind of, um, it, it seems like the Florida bonded bats really need fresh water and are not, um, I like hesitate to even say this because I'm thinking about uh, exceptions already, but it, it seems like salt water is not their thing and they much prefer fresh water. And once you start moving towards a more um, salt environment, it seems like their um, detections drop off. But like I said, I can tell you three places where they are foraging right near, um, in that story. So um, I think it would be something we'd take in with all the other information to decide. One of our favorite answers, it depends, right? Kind of on the project setting and other things happening. So, yeah. okay, fair enough. Um, so one of, I think our favorite questions we've talked about a number of times uh, over the years is how does one get training for acoustic surveys? And I'll just maybe um, start that response and then Sandra, feel free to jump in. But uh, we have been trying to coordinate and Sandra actually has um, on occasion been able to provide some opportunities. They're typically so far, I think out of state and not easy for us to access. And eventually it would be uh, really great for us to partner together if we can make that happen to provide some training, which we have talked about, but you know, lots of things going on to, um, not make that work at the moment. But uh, anyway, Sandra, do you have more to add on where someone might be able to get that training? Yeah, and also, uh, like I think of the training in two parts. The The first part is <clears throat> setting up acoustic equipment. And I think that can that can be done. That's that's more that's easier. But, you know, it's still something you need to learn. And it, it's more easy to learn, you know, you can learn from almost anyone that is doing it properly in you know a day or two um but the analysis that one is is a tougher thing to learn and also it you can't learn it in a week class anyway you really have to you know just practice and um so it's really i have a hard time giving great advice because um the, the first part setting up equipment is pretty like once you get that down it's it is kind of it, it is what it is um and it's getting easier and easier like the newer equipment is just getting easier and easier to set up um but the analysis you can't just say you know i took a week's course analyzing bad acoustics i'm good to go because um it's it gets kind of complicated um so I don't know. I think it's worth talking more about and trying to figure out like what what is most important or um, urgent to you all, and we can try to to um, figure something out. We can also do like dummy projects places if that would help. But um, maybe we can talk about that. Sure, sounds good. All right. Um, so back on critical habitat once the proposed critical habitat for the bonneted bat is approved, will we no longer need to survey projects outside of those areas for Florida bonneted bat impacts? Should we be surveying in the consultation area in the meantime? You'll always have to survey in the consultation area. Critical habitat is, is a whole 
separate um, thing and is not related to the range of the species. So the consultation area is what you look at for consultations. And then you started mentioning the range. And so I think this next question kind of ties into that. And it's actually from some folks up in the district two, Jacksonville, Lake City area. So they're just kind of curious about, um, is there any uh, indications that the range of the Florida bonnet tip bat is expanding northward due to climate change? Uh, no, but also we um, we don't really we we don't have enough range information to know what it is now. You know, well, I mean, I shouldn't say that we we don't, but we certainly don't have enough information to compare what we know now to what we knew. 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So we just don't, we don't have enough information to answer that question, but we do assume that that will be happening in the future if it is not happening now. Gotcha, yeah, maybe they're thinking about snail kite too, expanding into their <laughs> into their district. So, but yeah, good question. Um, yep. Another couple of questions kind of about the urban area and then other, you know, roosting habitats, but can you talk about the South Florida urban area and roosting and foraging preferences there? Sure, okay, so the reason we split out the urban area is because we felt that small, a smaller acreage, smaller acreages are more important in that area than in the rest of the species range. So in the key, it kind of um, will, will, will you know, shoot out, um, you'll have a different pathway depending on acreage and um, a smaller acreage would send you on a different path. But we felt like even at that small acreage, like five acres in Miami, five acres of habitat in Miami was more important to the bat than five acres in Charlotte County or something. So we wanted to have that difference. Um, other than that, there really, there really isn't any other change. So um, if you're, if your project is over five acres or so, um, there may not be any difference in the key, no matter you know, if your project is in the urban area. But that's a great question to come with me to and say, hey, um, I'm looking at the key, my project's in the urban area, can you help me go through it? I'd be more than happy to. Great, and that makes me think too of some other times where you've had the opportunity to help us out like if there's a lot of trees to survey or different things i think it's always a great chance to coordinate with sandra ahead of time to understand um, how to address especially if you have a, a big workload <laughs> on a project and to try to get some feedback before you um you know just jump right out there and start surveying so good thanks um so do you see any avoidance um, by the bat of residential areas yeah we don't really have data to help much with that unfortunately and then a couple of questions about is there any evidence of the bats using bridges for roosting we don't have any evidence of roosting in bridges i think there was one before my time roosting in a some sort of concrete crevice um so it's it's possible and we still want to keep an eye out but we don't know of any in a bridge so we're still looking for those on our bridges that are roughly 15 feet or higher right so they have that space to drop down that's kind of been our our threshold um but yeah okay and then i think one more quick question going back to the urban area discussion and the five acre threshold is that five acre threshold that you mentioned just the overall project area or the potential habitat um i think it is a project area um yeah it's project size footprint so yeah it's number three in the uh, in the key. Good, that's a great reference. And we can also um, provide that key for folks if they're not familiar with it. We can provide a link or whatever if that's helpful. So, well, great, Sandra. Thanks so much for the presentation. A lot of really great questions. And I think just for time, we'll go ahead and transition over to Kevin to talk through the Black Rail with us. So thanks a lot and welcome, Kevin.
Thank you. Um, thank you everybody for this opportunity to uh, talk to you about black rails. <clears throat> um, it is a relatively newly listed species, um, having been listed as threatened in November of 2020. The black rail is a very small rail. It's, a, it's the um, North America's smallest rail. It measures about five inches, um, and which is about between the size of a sparrow and a robin. And uh, it's dark. And not only is it rare, um, it is rarely seen. It just likes to be under dense cover, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, even those of us that have worked decades and have done a lot of black rail work, um, few of us have actually seen the bird. So um, don't be embarrassed if it's something you've never seen. You'll more, more likely hear it than you'll see it if you're in the right habitat. Next, uh, next slide. So like I said, it's a secretive marsh bird. Um, it uh, likes, it occupies um, the high tide marsh uh, in tidal systems um, and freshwater wetlands with very dense cover. So I like to describe it as if you can't see the ground below you, they're pretty happy to be in there. Um, the, their their um, suitable habitat is highly dependent on hydrology, we believe. Um, we have gone out to uh, wetlands and marshes where there have been black rails observed um, or heard and gone to other marshes that we can't find them. They look exactly the same, same features, same visual characteristics, measured care, and they're just not there. And we don't know, we don't understand why. But we think that's due to the hydrology and the microtopography within those marsh systems. North Florida and South Florida, or the Everglades are not the same. Most of Florida has the potential, both coastal and inland, to um, contain black rails. Um, but the the Everglades is very different with regard to seasonality, what's driving the populations, what's driving the habitat, those kinds of things. So we kind of look at Florida as coastal, northern and coastal, inland, and Everglades as kind of three, the three main um, distinct areas that black rails occur. Um, and nesting occurs from about approximately March through July, but we're still trying to figure out some of those um, get a better handle on, on the timing of their, of their nesting season. Next slide. Um, so like I said, they like very dense cover, fine stem emergent plants, so like um, sand core grass or black needle rush, um, where there has, um, there's been a lack of disturbance, recent disturbance, so that you have this very dense overhead cover they will run underneath that cover, stay underneath that cover almost the entire, as, you know, as much as they can, um, utilizing um, marsh rat, race rat trails underneath the cover. They'll put, place their nests on the ground or the, under the cover, slightly raised to keep them, keep them dry. Um, and they like, they um, need elevational variability in the substrate to accommodate fluctuations in water conditions. Um, they're almost the range on the, along the Atlantic coast, they're in high tide, high marsh, uh, which is a thin kind of um, strip of marshland between uplands and, and, and open water that is irregularly flooded, only flooded uh, at high during um, I had a couple times during the, the tidal cycle each month. Um, and that's where they like to be. Consequently, that's where a lot of um, activities, human activities occur uh, as well. Um, it's a key mosquito breeding area. So there's mosquito control happening in those sites, uh, things like that. So, and it's also highly, highly influenced or highly um, at risk from sea level rise. So basically this habitat type is getting squeezed between uplands and uh, sea level rise and um, pushing the birds closer and closer to, 
to the uplands and to predators. And next slide. So listed in uh, November of 2020, we it's been on our radar for a long time. Um, and previous position, petitions um, that were declined always cited a lack of information. So about a decade ago, we started to really try to figure out what the population, what the distribution of population was. Um, because it is a secret of marsh bird, um, it's hard to do really direct studies for them. Um, and they had become rare and rare. So what you see here is the historic distribution on, on the map on the left, and then the observations of um, counties where they were detected in um, on the right. Uh, so there's been greater you know, greater than 90% decline, um, a huge range con contraction, and historic hotspots have disappeared. And the things that have caused these, you know, those declines, those threats have not been abated. So sea level rise, in you know, incompatible land uses, um, wetland filling, dredging, things like that um, are still are still a problem. Next slide. So this is the, the range contraction that we talked about. Um, historically, they, the black rail is on the East Coast, which I'll probably focus most of my talk or my information on. Um, on the East Coast, occurred from Massachusetts to Florida. Um, in 2016, the range had contracted to New, to, uh, New Jersey. Um, there were no observations north of New Jersey. And now um, there are no, as of 2020, um, the species have been largely extirpated um, north of South Carolina, which is uh, hugely concerning. Um, even more concerning are the number of pairs that, um, that we currently estimate the population to, to have on the Atlantic coast, which is, um, we think, less than 1,000. And Florida is is kind of um, supports greater than eighty percent of that population either through resident birds or um, migrants that are coming into winter. And now we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and so next slide. And then this is just an example of of hot spots that have significantly declined. That has um, extirpating where the species has been extirpated. And Elliott Island is a is an area uh, in Chesapeake Bay that was like the you know long time historic like place where people would go to to hear and try to see black rails for a long, long time. Um, and in two you know starting in 2007 we had a significant significant decline to so now since 2014, um, the birds are, are no longer there. Um, black rails are highly, have, have always been kind of highly sought after by the birding community for, you know, you know for observation. Um, and, and that's where we've gotten, a, you know, relied on for a lot of our information. And this site was just one of the, one of the places that everybody knew to go. And now um, they're gone. Next slide. Um, so I talked a little bit about the threats uh, in coastal systems and tidal systems. They occupy like this this narrow band of high tide marsh um, that has long, for a long time been a target for uh, draining and filling and you know pat you know for pastures up in the northeast historically for um, they used to uh, salt. Our, um, um, farm salt hay for various reasons. Um, it's uh, it's an area that is a prolific mosquito breeding area. So it's been targeted by to control mosquitoes through open marsh water management. 
um, all sorts of hydrologic modifications that occurred in, in this kind of narrow band of high, you know, high marsh. That is those, the threats that that area has been impacted by sea level rise, um, particularly in those areas where um, marsh migration cannot happen, where there's no place for that, for high, high marsh to push into. Um, lack of fire um, in, in the south, particularly in Florida, um, marshes are fight, you know, fire adapted system and fire uh, helps to control the woody vegetation uh, coming in. Um, predators are often a problem once that woody vegeta vegetation comes in or the remaining high tide, you know, high marshes, it's close to, it's, you know, pushes the birds closer to, to um, woody vegetation when predators hide, and then all sorts of incompatible land use. Uh, next slide. Uh, but Florida, like I said, is a is a stronghold for the species. This is a this is a occupancy model that we're some colleagues of mine are currently working on to try to to try to develop and refine. But it kind of shows the distribution of of um, black rails in Florida. There's uh, large, you know, when I say large, <laughs> there's there is a fair number of birds in the Everglades and, and around Lake Okeechobee um, in the Big Bend area. Um, but that is still, his, compared to historic, historic um, observations, we've lost a lot of um, birds or observations out of the southwest of Florida and in some of the northeast spots. Um, again, this is still you know, greater, eight, greater than 80% of the East Coast population. and um, probably slightly more than 500 pairs um, reside in Florida. Next slide. So um, the species and its biology make it really hard. It, got, it, it took a lot of time for us to actually get to the point where we could make a, you know, accept a position, p petition and make a listing decisions because of a low probability to a probability of detection. They're so secretive, so you never see them. Um, only if you're in the right habitat at the right time, uh, those kinds of things. Um, so it also makes kind of um, recovery and um, the consultation process a little bit challenging as well. Um, I mentioned that the species are highly sought after for by the birding public. Um, which is the reason why critical habitat has not been designated because it would identify very discrete locations on the ground where black rails are. And um, that, would it, that would increase potential threat of birders going out to observe the, the birds and do what we call playback calling, which disrupts their breeding process and social structure. Um, if anybody you know know about eBird, eBird also has kind of buffered um, their their known observations so that you can't um, identify what spots and what hotspots um, black rails have been observed from. Uh, there's been a few directed surveys uh, for black rails, it's, you know, range wide. Uh, that's improving. Um, we're trying to do more uh, surveys to help us better understand the species and the habitats that they need. Um, we, for consultation purposes, we recommend surveys at sites with suitable habitat. And for Florida, that's Everglades, that's um, those high tide areas in the Northeast and, and Big Bend area, um, and inland wetlands with dense heavy vegetation freshwater wetlands. Um, and we are, we have, we do have species, species specific survey methods, um, but we're trying to develop more guidance on timing and frequency and that will be coming soon. Next slide. So 
we really want to try to recover the species and it's, it, it, it occupies this very narrow niche of habitat that um, is suitable, provides out everything they need from cover to uh, forage conditions and things like that. So uh, this is a graph of just a generalized wetland. And you can imagine the uh, black line, squiggly line being either uh, daily or monthly tot title title levels. Um, inland, it could be um, seasonal rain patterns. And so they they're they they can't have it they can't have it to be too dry. They like um, areas that are that have they need a nest and be near areas that are either moist soil or less than three centimeters deep. Anything more than that, um, they're going to be flooded out. Anything less than that, they're not going to have the food resource, food resources that they need. So they have this very narrow band, and for management and recovery, we need to try to figure out what that, how to make that, or how to provide that on a site and broader scale. Next slide. Um, and so uh, one of the ways that we can do that is to either add water or add topography. Um, there's there's a number of ways that we can do that. Uh, managed wetlands, um, impoundments, things like that. We can we can adjust the the water levels. Um, inland inland wetlands, we can do some things. Some novel uh, we have some novel ways to provide water resources um, in appropriate habitat. Um, and we can add, add to to topography. So kind of slightly modifying or restoring um, previously modified areas to create like um, a bit of micro topography within um, wetland systems. Next slide. And then they need, I like I said before, they don't like to have have um, woody vegetation nearby. Um, they, they like that sparse woody vegetation. So we kind of have to control control kind of succession in in coastal and inland wetland areas. Um, so when mangroves and high tide bush and other things start to move in, um, we want to promote prescribed burns in those in those areas that are historically fire fire dependent. Um, in some areas, uh, there is grazing uh, in and particularly in inland areas, there's there's there could be grazing in wetlands that would um, create too sparse of vegetation so you, they don't get that that overhead cover so working on all those fronts with regard to vegetation is important next slide and so what we're really trying to do is is to find that sweet spot that that spot where we're, where we have a, a, a fire frequency that's that's appropriate um within the habitat and we're working there's a large project that i'm working on working with um on the gulf coast to really figure that out um in some in some cases manage those grazers so that there's the vegetation doesn't get too sparse we want to and we want to provide water delivery to get the white water in areas that have some level of micro topography um, in Florida, the other thing that makes it challenging is we, we're dealing with um, all these conditions all at once. And so the small number of birds that we do have, what, we, what, we, we're, what we're beginning to think is that they are moving around the landscape um, kind of annually. So what looks like really good, what, you know, we might find a, a population of black rails at one site one year because the you know because we we've, we've hit that sweet spot that bingo area, but the next year there's a there's a, a hurricane or, or it's a drought year or something and so they're not at that site they're a different site and 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 that we that we don't know so we have to like think about providing all those things both at the site level like the micro topography and the water delivery and things like that 
but we have to have redundancy throughout the system, throughout the landscape, so that they can they can move around, so they have more opportunities to find places where that that hit all those things. Uh, next slide. That's all I have. Um, it's a you know we're still learning a whole lot about this bird. Um, it's its needs and and figuring out what you know how best to manage them and and what's you know what's appropriate. Um, and we do have a um, black rail working group for Florida. So I don't know if any, any of um, y'all and, and Department of Trans Transportation have been involved in that, but feel free to contact me. We'll get you on the list. Um, and it's kind of a collaborative effort to you know figure out what we can do to um, better protect and, and enhance habitat for the species. Um, Florida had, like I said, Florida has a huge responsibility in recovery of the species. Um, and so kind of the front lines of figuring all this stuff out. And that's all I have. Take any questions. Yeah, thank, thanks, Kevin. I think I think you're right. It looks like a lot of opportunity for potential transportation to intersect with some of those occupancy models that you guys are developing. And obviously just the habitat in general, there's a lot of that um, where we have roadways. So um, I guess I was just kind of curious I, I don't think, but I could be wrong, that we've had any actual consultations with Black Rail so far for transportation projects. Have, have you worked with um, Zakia or John on not that, that yet? Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Okay, okay. So I guess kind of as we as we go through those, um, if we have projects that come up, we just, I was just kind of also curious about any conservation measures related specifically to transportation projects, but those may be kind of like having to be developed as we go. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's such a kind of new, a new thing um, right. that you know I think it's going to be a site by site thing. Um, understanding like what that you know what the what it looks like at the site, what the potential impacts are, and how you know how best to mitigate. It. There's there's a lot of I think I think it it is an interesting species because I think there is really good ways that novel approaches that we can think about mitigation. Um, so okay. Um, you also mentioned the eBird data, which I thought was interesting between the eBird data and the critical habitat, having to kind of be really mindful about sharing that information or developing even the critical habitat because of birders. And I am a birder, but I, I try to be responsible. But anyway, um, I did want to just also maybe say we should maybe reach back out to um, Zakia and, and John separately. But uh, I do think we do have the eBird data available in some of the GIS tools that we use. So I think it might be important for us to understand, like if we do use that data, that they still, you know, as we go through consultations, still need to make sure we're coordinating with you so we know kind of where those intersections of our projects are with some of that data to having to buffer it some. But um, yeah. good, good to understand that that's something they're having yeah, to do. Yeah, and anytime, anytime you have a, a project that where there's wetlands involved and you have that really dense vegetation. Um, like I said, even if the, if, even if we don't have data there, um, if there's suitable habitat there, data, or if there's suitable, suitable habitat available and it's got the right landscape context, it's something that we want to look at to, to think about, um, you know, surveys and, and mitigation measures. Um, so. And then speaking of the surveys, I'm not sure if we're familiar with the survey protocols, but if there's something you can share, we can certainly put that in the chat and make sure that's available for folks, again, because it's kind of newer, like you said, that might not be mm -hmm. something that we've necessarily seen or shared out with um, our, our DOT staff or the consultant community. Some folks may already have that handy, but I'm not sure that we've seen it. So if you don't mind, maybe afterwards uh, sharing that, we can chat that out for folks too. I'll do that. It's a you know it's a survey that's that is conducted either in the morning or evenings. Um, these are birds that largely call at night, um, and and um, there's a there's a lot of, there's a lot of condition there's a lot of like specificity to the to the survey protocol for this bird um, given its its susceptibility to um, to call playbacks. Um, so it is a call playback survey um, to enhance the detection probability, but at very specific times and very specific lengths. So I can get that out to you. Okay, great, great. Well, um, we do have two more presentations. So I think we'll go ahead and take one more really quick break and come back at 11.35.
and then um, address any additional questions we have after that. So thanks so much.
All right, welcome back. We have one more species specific highlight from Curtis, and then we'll also get into our National Wildlife Refuge um, talk after that. So Curtis, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Katasha. Good morning again, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to provide a um, species highlight on Nassau grouper. Uh, I volunteered for this uh, because the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service uh, Species Recovery Coordinator for NASCO, Nassau grouper retired uh, recently, but I thought the species would be of interest to um, the, the FDOT group, particularly District 7 and District 4. Next slide. Um, the figure on the left shows the known range of Nassau grouper. You can see that it extends about halfway up the Florida Peninsula, um, includes um, the southeastern Gulf of Mexico, all of the Caribbean Sea, and actually extends out to Bermuda um, there to the northeast. Uh, on the right, the two figures um, show the locations of known spawning aggregations. Um, Nassau grouper is a, a species that um, goes through a number of migrations in their life history and forms spawning aggregations. And uh, figure A on top um, shows the historical locations of, of known spawning aggregations. You can see a lot of them along the Yucatan Peninsula of Belize um, and a number of them um, throughout the, the Bahamas and then around the island of Cuba and then a few south of Cuba near um, the Cayman Islands as well as a few um, to the east near Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, and the um, figure B shows the locations of known spawning aggregations uh, as of 2007. So this is about a, a two-thirds reduction of the number of spawning aggregations that are, are known to be actively used. Next slide. The Nassau grouper is primarily a shallow water species that's long been prized as a, a food fish uh, throughout the Caribbean and South Florida, Bermuda and the Bahamas. Um, like most groupers, they're slow growing and long lived. They live up to 29 years. Um, while Nassau grouper are considered a reef fish, they go through different, um, they use different habitats throughout their life stage and um, yeah, have onto genetic shifts in habitat use and um, food prey. Um, as larvae, they're planktonic. And that's how um, they distribute um, from those spawning aggregations to um, the juvenile habitats. The, the spawning aggregation locations are not um, larval or juvenile habitat. The juveniles um, usually settle in neutral or shallow waters using macroalgal and seagrass habitats. And there's been some research showing that you know, combination of macroalgae and coral um, is a highly preferred um, settlement habitat and juvenile habitat for um, Nassau grouper. Um, but as they get older, um, they tend to um, move into different habitats near shore hard bottom and up to the reefs um, as they get older and older. Nassau, adult Nassau grouper tend to have high site fidelity um, and are usually on high relief coral reefs and, and rocky substrates um, from shoreline out to as much as 130 meters. Um, loss of habitat is, um, for different life history stages, is one of the threats to the species. Um, the extent of habitat used by juvenile Nassau grouper in the Florida Keys um, remains unknown. There hasn't been a whole lot of uh, research directed uh, specifically at Nassau grouper, but um, so far Nassau grouper smaller than 19 centimeters have not been observed uh, in the Florida Keys. But um, larger adults tend to occupy deeper and more um, rigorous reef areas. Um, adults and juveniles will use natural or artificial reefs. Um, these are a, a couple of photos that I've, I've taken in the past few years, um, particularly the um, Nassau grouper on the right that was on artificial reef off um, Fort Lauderdale um, is further north than some of the information that the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service had, had used in looking at the listing uh, for the species. So it's interesting to see that they, they are being uh, observed further north. Uh, there have been observations as far north as um, Boynton Inlet.
Next slide. Some background information on the ESA listing in Nassau Grouper. From the 1970s to the 1990s, uh, declines in Nassau Grouper catches uh, were observed in Florida and around the Caribbean. Um, most of these declines were attributed to uh, directed fishing and known spawning aggregations. Um, you can see the, the photo on the right shows an aggregation. And um, you know, if, if there are boats um, fishing, fishing that location, um, you know, knowing the, the moon phase and, and tidal phase and time of day, um, they can really be hammered. Um, next slide. So in 1992, uh, the Satellite Fishery Management Council prohibited the harvest and possession of Nassau Group or Angolias in the, um, the South Atlantic uh, Exclusive Economic Zone. Um, in response to these observed declines. And since the early 1990s, we've seen these two species go in different directions. Uh, Goliath grouper has increased uh, as a result of the protections from harvest. However, the abundance of Nassau grouper has not followed that pattern. Next slide. Um, the ESA listing details for, for Nassau grouper, a petition for listing was received by National Marine Fisheries Service uh, on September 3rd, 2010. Um, no fisheries completed a biological report and that's where those, um, those spying aggregation uh, figures came from. But they found that Nassau grouper still occurred throughout its historical range, but the continued fishing on spying aggregations was um, likely to place the species in danger of extinction. Uh, the proposed rule for, for listing as, as threatened was published in in 2014, and the final rule for ESA listing became effective July 29th, 2016. Um, it's my understanding from colleagues in the Protected Resources Division that um, a proposed rule for designation of critical habitat is expected to be advertised this year, but um, just wanted to point out that areas under consideration for critical habitat did not include Florida. So that goes back to a previous, a question on one of the previous presentations of, um, you know, if the species occurs there, but critical habitat is not designated, do you still have to consult? And yeah, you do. Um, while the primary species uh, threat to the species is continued fishing on um, spawning aggregations in Caribbean jurisdictions, um, you know, loss of, of habitat for the different life history stages is, is also important. Um, the threats relevant to Florida Department of Transportation projects um, our potential impacts from noise, as Dave mentioned earlier, calling out NASA grouper, particularly less than two grams, but, but even larger individuals. Um, impacts to juvenile habitat, as I mentioned, um, macroalgae, seagrass, and hard bottom. And then uh, adult use of bridge structures um, is, a, is a potential um, potential threat. And also um, an area, a threat that may not come to mind immediately, but um, potential impacts from artificial reef deployments of bridge rubble uh, on sites with existing artificial reef material. So um, yeah, these are some things that um, when we're looking at, at bridge projects here in, in Southeast Florida and the Florida Keys that we need to be mindful of. Mm, that was my last slide. Thanks so much, Curtis. I'm just uh, not seeing any specific questions at the moment. So maybe we can, um, in the interest of time, let Jeremy go ahead and go through his presentation. If we get any questions for you, we can maybe just uh, respond to the audience in writing. But thanks for that, um, for that species highlight. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Jeremy Phillips uh, with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And Glad to be here. It's an honor to talk to you today about uh, the National Wildlife Refuge System and uh, give you a little virtual tour of refuges in Florida. Uh, and I'll also briefly talk about our role in planning as well. Okay, so the National Wildlife Refuge System was founded by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1903. So we are 119 years old as a system. 
Um, I think everyone is familiar with national parks, which are also managed by our agency, the U.S. Department of the Interior, but by a sister bureau of ours, the National Park Service. But you may not be as familiar with refuges. Um, national Wildlife Refuge System is the largest network of lands in the world set aside for wildlife, such as this place on Albatross at Midway Atoll Refuge out in the middle of the Pacific. Um, we have 568 national wildlife refuges uh, that cover 95 million acres in all 50 states and five U.S. territories, uh, including two of which I help oversee, which are in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, we also manage five national monuments. But uh, national wildlife refuges are for people too. Next slide, please. So we have uh, hunting and fishing, for example, are allowed on the majority of our refuges. A lot of people don't, don't realize that. Um, we also have birding, nature photography, hiking, environmental education and interpretation. Um, and just as an example, last year, just in Florida alone, we had 7.8 million people visited National Wildlife Refuges. Uh, we had more than 18,000 hunting visits and about 1.5 million fishing visits. Um, we also had about 30,000 people, students and adults, that participated in environmental education on refuges. Um, so it's very much a place for, uh, for people, for recreation, as well as uh, wildlife and habitats. Um, we also conduct habitat management, such as prescribed burning, to reduce the risk of wildfires to our communities uh, and to improve wildlife habitat. Refuges also monitor wildlife populations and we serve as living laboratories for scientists and students. Next slide, please. So we're gonna take a brief tour around the state and visit some national wildlife refuges. Uh, we have 30 in Florida that are managed as part of seven refuge complexes. Um, so starting, uh, starting the south there, um, Florida Keys, uh, we also have the Loxahatchee Refuge Complex uh, there just southeast of Lake Okeechobee, um, which also includes Hope Sound on the Atlantic coast. Um, just south of Orlando there, we have the Everglades Headwaters Complex, which also includes Archie Carr and Pelican Island Refuges on the coast. Um, the Southwest Florida Complex, uh, which includes refuges such as Florida Panther, 10,000 Islands, and Ding Darling. And Crystal River Complex, um, which includes, besides Crystal River, Chasawitska, um, and several other refuges, um, also Merritt Island, there on the Space Coast, um, Cape Canaveral, and the North Florida Complex in the Big Bend area, um, just south of Tallahassee, around uh, Apalachicola. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so starting in the south, um, the Florida Keys complex, we have four refuges there, uh, National Key Deer, Crocodile Lake, Key West, and Great White Heron. Um, these refuges protect species such as the Key Deer and American Crocodile, um, but also we have islands that host nesting seabirds and sea turtles. Um, Key West National Wildlife Refuge is one of the oldest refuges in the country. It was actually established in 1908. Um, and if you drive to the end of the road there at Key West and look out, uh, many of those um, uninhabited islands um, there off the coast are managed by us as part of Key West National Wildlife Refuge. And they provide important habitat for um, nesting birds, for sea turtles, and for many other species of wildlife. Okay, next slide, please. So moving up the state, um, the Loxahatchee Refuge there along Lake Okeechobee. Uh, it's one of the largest urban refuges in the country with more than 145,000 acres of land where visitors can reconnect with nature. Um, has Everglades ecosystems, including wet prairies, uh, sawgrass ridges, tree islands, um, and cypress swamps. And they provide habitat for more than 250 species of birds, um, as well as mammals and reptiles and amphibians. Okay, 
Next slide, please. As its name suggests, uh, Everglades Headwaters National Wildlife Refuge and Conservation Area is at the headwaters of the Everglades ecosystem. So um, it's extremely important um, as a place for wildlife, but also for wild water quality uh, for the Everglades. Um, it's one of the great grassland and savanna landscapes of Eastern North America, it's still mostly rural. Um, the greater Everglades area is consists of grass wetlands, longleaf pine savannas, uh, and cattle ranches, um, and has a, important assemblages of wildlife there. Um, also, Archie Carr um, on the coast is part of this refuge complex. Um, it's one of the most important sea turtle nesting beaches in the world. And then uh, Pelican Island is actually the very first national wildlife refuge um, established by President Teddy Roosevelt in 1903. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is quite a diverse group of photos. Um, <laughs> these are all managed out of one uh, refuge complex. So it just shows you the diversity of wildlife and habitats that we manage. Um, so this includes the uh, Southwest Florida um, National Wildlife, I'm sorry, the um, Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge, um, Ding Darling, and 10,000 Islands, and several other National Wildlife Refuges um, along the coast. Um, Florida Panther is, uh, was established, of course, um, for that species, but it also helped protect many other species that are native to South Florida. And uh, Ding Darling is part of the largest undeveloped mangrove ecosystem in the United States. Um, it's it's world famous for spectacular migratory bird populations. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the North Florida Refuge Complex. Um, so this includes St. Mark's, St. Vincent, Lower Suwannee, and Cedar Keys. Um, St. Mark's was established in 1931 for migratory birds, so it's one of our older refuges as well. Um, consists of about 83,000 acres. Um, we also have a lighthouse that we manage there, which is pretty unusual for, uh, for a National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and then St. Vincent National Wildlife Refuge is along the coast as well as a, a bear island off the coast of um, Apalachicola there. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Um, this refuge traces its beginnings to the development of the nation's space program. So in 1962, NASA acquired the lands and waters adjacent to Cape Canaveral to establish the John F. Kennedy Space Center. Um, of course, they built the launch complex and other space-related facilities, but <clears throat> did not need to develop most of the area. So um, in 1963, um, that area that NASA acquired became um, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so we work very closely with NASA and today with SpaceX and with many other um, agencies and, uh, and companies um, to manage the land that surrounds those launch facilities. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, moving over to Crystal River National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it was the only refuge created specifically for the protection of the Florida manatee. Um, it preserves three sister springs, um, which is the last unspoiled and undeveloped habitat in Kings Bay. Um, we also have Chasawitska and several refuges in the Tampa Bay area that are part of this refuge complex as well. Okay, and I just wanna say, so that's a very <laughs> brief tour of uh, our seven uh, Florida refuge complexes. Um, again, 30 total refuges. And um, I, I wanna highlight that we don't do this conservation work alone. So we work closely with state agencies, with local governments, um, non-governmental organizations, um, and our Fish and Wildlife Service colleagues. So um, typically when a project, whether it's transportation related or otherwise, is reviewed um, by ecological services and could impact a National Wildlife Refuge, we will often work together uh, on a single Fish and Wildlife Service response. Um, but there are situations where maybe you do need to 
work with a refuge individually. In those cases, you just reach out to the refuge manager um, who would be glad to assist. Um, and in addition to uh, Endangered Species Act and um, NEPA and Archaeological Resources Protection Act and other laws, we also have our own laws and regulations that are specific to the National Wildlife Refuge System, um, such as the Refuge Improvement Act of 1997. So part of that process, we determine whether have to determine whether a uh, use of the refuge um, is appropriate and compatible, uh, meaning that it will not materially interfere with or detract from the fulfillment of the purpose of the National Wildlife Refuge System or for which that particular refuge was established. Okay, next slide, please. And I'll just <clears throat> leave you with a photo of President Teddy Roosevelt. Um, hanging out on one of our National Wildlife Refuges. Um, he's on the beach looking out at the Gulf of Mexico at Brenton Island National Wildlife Refuge in Louisiana. Um, it's actually the only photo that we have of him on the system that he created, um, the National Wildlife Refuge system, um, which he established to conserve wildlife for future generations. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. That's such a great legacy, great picture to end with, and um, a great overview. I think just a quick tour is just really great to see all the different refuges. I didn't realize we had that many in Florida, actually. I'm familiar with a handful of them, but um, just uh, also, I guess, the history of you know having Pelican Island as the first one, pretty cool, too. Um, guess I wanted to just see, we don't have any specific questions at the moment, but um, you mentioned the number of visitors that you guys tend to see on a fairly regular basis. Are you experiencing an increase because of um, the pandemic? And do you anticipate that that increase of users to continue on even as um, we're kind of coming out of some of the, the pandemic concerns? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we actually did observe um, a significant increase in visitation um, to our trails and beaches um, during the pandemic. So while some of our you know, visitor centers and facilities were not open, um, it was great to be able to provide this outlet for folks um, to go out and enjoy nature. Um, and so, yeah, we did, we saw, we saw a significant increase in, in folks and, and a lot of new user groups. Um, that many of whom told us that they had never been out to a refuge before. And, um, you know, they, they really wanted to get outside and, um, and just discovered refuges for the first time. So that was really cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So um, there's a question about what is the revenue source for maintaining the National Wildlife Refuges? So for the most part, it's appropriated funds. Um, However, we do have at some National Wildlife Refuges, there are um, rec recreation fees. So that could be fees associated with entrance. It could be associated with a hunt program, for example. And in cases where fees are collected, those go back towards um, recreational opportunities on that specific National Wildlife Refuge. Great. Um, yeah, I think the, you know, going through the ways that you we may um, kind of intersect with right a refuge during a transportation project hearing about those different laws and the law specific to the wildlife refuge program was important um, that wasn't one that I had personally come across before so good to know that and then I also was thinking about 4f as well maybe something that we would intersect with y'all and have to go through that process um, but really I get I think you said at the beginning kind of a well-kept secret right uh, the refuge program or um, system is really impressive in my opinion, the times I've been able to visit. Um, one more maybe quick question, it might be a little unfair, but do you happen to have a favorite or particular region that you that you like the most? Well, I've spent, um, I've spent most of my career in the Southeast region, um, but started as a seasonal biotech uh, up in South Dakota. And um, so my, my personal favorites, of course, are ones that I have, um, personal experience with, you know, so Sand Lake National Wildlife Refuge up there in, in South Dakota, and then um, several refuges that I've worked on in Mississippi and Alabama, um, such as Bon Secours on the Gulf of Mexico and Mississippi Sand Hill Crane. 
Um, so each of those has kind of a, um, you know, a special place in my heart, but also, you know, favorite spots um, from working in the field on those refuges. So, but I've traveled and seen seen a lot of them all over the country, and and it's a great thing to um, to include as you know as part of your trip. For sure, yeah. Thanks for all your great work on that, and certainly they they're all great. All the ones I've had a chance to visit. So. Thanks for your presentation today. I'm not seeing any additional questions um, for you or for the other presenters at the moment. I know we're coming up um, on the hour. So I just want to maybe quickly close out with a couple more slides. Um, San, or, I mean, sorry, Kendra, we can go ahead and just, this is just the overview of what we've spoken about today. I think we're all pretty familiar with that. But I do want to invite, if we could maybe jump to the next slide, invite folks to um, check out our website. This is where all the recordings and the handouts and the calculator information that Dave talked about today will be residing. It's already being built out. We already have uh, sessions one, two, and three provided there. So session four will be up and running in the next couple of days and all that content will be available for you. Uh, Denise already shared that link out in the chat earlier today, but um, if she has a chance, maybe she can share it out one more time just so it's handy for folks. And then I think we also wanted to just um, invite any feedback that you have. You can send that directly to myself or Denise uh, to just kind of take in, you know, if we do this again, what kind of improvements can we make? Or do you have any suggestions for future trainings that might be helpful? Doesn't have to be, you know, a, such a big webinar series, but if there's a particular topic we need to dive into deeper or any other sort of um, specific species or things that you think would be helpful to learn about, please let us know that as well. And then I think just um, one more really heartfelt thank you We've had so many presenters come and speak with us, um, some of them multiple times, and it does take a lot of time and effort on their part to um, prepare and get ready for um, these sort of things. And then just, you know, the Q&A has been really, really great. We appreciate all the audience participation, but then all the really great feedback that our presenters have been able to share with everyone. And so thank you so much for such a successful webinar series. And um, we'll just end with that. And thanks so much. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone again really soon. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.